It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. But who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Those are the words of Theodore Roosevelt, our 26th president and the subject of this, the 26th episode of the Dead Presidents Podcast. We're back. We're the hosts with the most who thrust their fists against the post and still insist they see the ghosts of dead presidents. I am here with the inimitable James J. Hamilton. That's me, here with the ineffable Stephen Lincoln Douglas. That's right, and we're back. It's season three of the Dead Presidents Podcast, episode 26. Can you believe it? What a journey through history we have taken thus far. But... It's only just begun. That's right. We're descending back into the arena to go face to face with a man who spent his whole life there. That's just it. Theodore Roosevelt. Technically, Theodore Roosevelt Jr. What an epic life, and we're going to dive into it right now. It began on October 27th, 1858 in New York City. He was the second child and first son of Theodore Roosevelt Sr. and Martha Mitty Bullock Roosevelt. The forebears of the Roosevelts immigrated from the Netherlands to New York in the mid-1600s when it was still called New Amsterdam and became a wealthy and prominent family. I'm not going to sing They Might Be Giants right now, although I'm tempted. Those Roosevelts, they were a big deal. Theodore Sr., was successful in the banking and plate glass importing businesses, and he would become a pretty major philanthropist, helped to found the New York Children's Orthopedic Hospital, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the American Museum of Natural History. And he was a big influence on his son, Theodore Jr., who later wrote that his father was, quote, the best man I ever knew. And also that before making any major decision as president, he would think about what his father would have done. Yeah, quite an influence on young Teddy. His mother, Mitty, meanwhile, was a classic Southern belle who grew up in Georgia in a prominent slave-owning plantation family. She was witty, charming, and beautiful. And some believe that the character of Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind was partly based on her. That's right. I think the author corresponded with a friend of Mitty, shared some reminiscences. That's quite a woman to be uh, your mother in New York during the Civil War. Yeah. Because Theodore Sr. was a Lincoln Republican, but Mitty supported the South. During the Civil War, her brothers fought in the Confederate Army. Yeah, that's it. Uh... Theodore Jr., our subject here, later described her as, quote, entirely unreconstructed to the day of her death, and her Southern sympathies contributed to Theodore Sr.'s decision to avoid Union military service by paying for a substitute, a la Grover Cleveland. He instead developed a system for Union soldiers to send part of their pay home to their families and work as a commissioner to enroll soldiers in the program. Now, many have suggested that latent guilt over his father's avoidance in the Civil War 
uh, fueled Theodore Jr.'s zealous desire to see military action as an adult. So his father, pretty influential in a couple different ways. Mm hmm. Yeah, that was a big war where a lot of people fought in it. And then Theodore, seeing, you know, his father was not among those who fought, he was not going to have that stigma attached to him ever. That's it. And like many uh, things we've talked about, uh, Ulysses Grant and Julia Dent. Their families were opposed. Mm -hmm. And here we have it again. There was a lot of that. That's right. And Chester Arthur key. with the Southern exactly. life during the Civil with War. His, with Nell <clears throat> Arthur, uh, devoted to the South. Um, pretty yeah. wild. Yeah, the Civil War wasn't just brothers against cousins and husbands against uncles. Sometimes it was husbands and wives. That's, a, that's right. And they all had swords on their hands. Quite a tense environment for little Teddy to grow up in. That's it. He's the second of four children, having an older sister, Anna, nicknamed Bamie, a younger brother, Elliot, and younger sister, Corinne. Theodora was a thin and sickly child suffering from frequent illnesses, including chronic diarrhea and debilitating asthma. Not a great picture at this point. When he's not bedridden by poor health, he is pretty extremely energetic and active. So, kind of a contrast there. He's trying to be active despite uh, his illnesses. He's going to develop a passionate interest in animals. He becomes skilled in taxidermy, and he amasses a large collection of specimens, which he called the Roosevelt Museum of Natural History. He's obsessed with, uh, well, all sorts of things involving nature, including uh, ornithology, studying birds, and recording information about them. His father is going to gift him a gun, and he's going to become an avid hunter. Uh, at first, he's trying to obtain bird specimens, and then eventually he starts doing it for sport, which, well... He's going to become... A pretty great hunter. Yeah. <clears throat> as we will see coming up. As a child, he was mostly homeschooled. He was also a voracious reader. He particularly favored adventure stories and works on animal science, just devouring everything in his family's library. He could read extremely fast, and he had a nearly photographic memory, enabling him to consume and retain huge amounts of information. Yeah, it's actually pretty incredible. Yeah, it's yeah, it's crazy when you think about how many books he would read in his life. And even as president, he was reading, like, several books a day. That's it. He's and, nine years old when he writes a paper titled The Natural History of Insects. Yeah. No and, one Yeah, no one in school was making him do that. No. That's what he does for just fun. He's it. And, and he also begins keeping a diary at this age. Mm -hmm. At the age of 12, as he continued to suffer from asthma, his father sat him down and told him, quote, You have the mind, but not the body. And without the help of the body, the mind cannot go as far as it should. You must make your body. It is hard drudgery to make one's body, but I know you will do it. Yeah. And... Theodore would vow to do so. He's going to begin attending a gymnasium every day. He spends enormous amounts of time exercising. He learns how to box. He tests his, his physical endurance in swimming, rowing, hiking, horseback riding. And he's going to experience pretty dramatic physical results. His health improves. And by the end of his teenage years, he had largely overcome his asthma. Yeah. So, yeah. pretty big turnaround. Yeah, you really did kind of make his body into something that it hadn't been before, and he was previously spent a lot of time bedridden. He's going to be able to get out there in the world. That's just it, and that's just what they're going to do. In 1869, the Roosevelt family embarks on a two-year tour of Europe, and in 1872, they visit Egypt and the Middle East. As biographer Edmund Morris put it, 
By age 15, Theodore, quote, had traveled exhaustively in Britain, Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East, visiting their great cities time and again, and actually living in some for long periods. He had plumbed the catacombs and climbed the Great Pyramid, slept in a monastery, and toured a harem. He had hunted jackals on horseback, kissed the Pope's hand, stared into a volcano, traced an ancient civilization to its source, and followed the wanderings of Jesus. He had been exposed to much of the world's greatest art and architecture, become conversant in two foreign languages, and felt as much at home in Arab bazaars as at a German coffee house or on the shaven lawns of an English estate. Wow. End quote. Wow. Quite an experience for young Theodore Roosevelt. That's Taking... it. He is, he is becoming educated yep. naturally. But Those are the advantages of his uh, family's wealth and status enabling him to see the world. That's it. At a very young age and become very knowledgeable and experienced in a lot of different things. That's just it. He's becoming educated in terms of just his journeys uh, throughout the world. But uh, let's get to his legitimate education here in the United States. Uh, Theodore returns. And he's determined to ready himself to enter Harvard University by passing its rigorous entrance exams, which you could skip by listening to every episode of this podcast. Yeah, not an option available to him at the time, but... Them's the breaks. You guys are lucky. Young Theodore was already extremely well-versed in many subjects, including science, history, geography, French, and German. But there were others that Harvard required that he was weak in, including Greek, Latin, and mathematics. So his family, once again taking advantage of his privileged upbringing, they hire him an eminent private tutor, and he spends almost two years in nearly constant study. And then in 1875, he's going to pass the Harvard entrance exams and enter the university in the fall of 1876, right around his 18th birthday. So definitely somebody that applies himself and says, hey, I have to do this. I'm going to do it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, when he sets his mind to something, he just goes goes nuts on it. That's it. Um, academically, he's going to rise from average grades during his freshman year to the top 10% of his class in his sophomore and junior years. During the summer of 1877, he wrote and published his first short book, The Summer Birds of the Adirondacks. It was favorably reviewed, and Theodore received his father's blessing to pursue a career as a natural scientist. Well, his future is all mapped out. Seems so, but is it? Well, a lot of things can happen in a couple years. Well, 1877, President Rutherford B. Hayes nominated Theodore Roosevelt Sr. as Collector of Customs for New York. As our listeners will recall from a few of our previous episodes, yeah. Hayes intending to score a victory for civil service reform by replacing Chester Arthur, who was then the poster boy for corruption of the spoils system. However, as we know, the New York machine boss, Senator Roscoe Conkling, blocked and eventually defeated the nomination. That battle made national headlines, and it left Theodore Sr. humiliated and physically deteriorated. He developed he developed a gastrointestinal tumor and died in February 1878 at the age of 46. Right. Theodore Jr., obviously devastated over the loss. Uh, he believed himself to be vastly inferior to his father, and he's going to redouble his efforts to make something of himself in order to be worthy of his name. His aristocratic upbringing had already earned him a place in the upper crust of Harvard society, where he's going to associate primarily with the wealthy gentlemen among his classmates. He was an officer in a wide array of student organizations, and in 1878, he joins the prestigious Porcellian Club. 
That's right. And his socializing with Boston's wealthy elite is going to lead him to meet young Alice Lee, the cousin of one of his classmates, the daughter of a wealthy banker. Alice was very beautiful and very charming, and Theodore vowed to himself that he was going to marry her. That's it. Again. He sets these goals for himself, and by God, he's going to find a way to make them happen. Whether Alice Lee likes it or not, and no matter else who might be offended, because before heading off to college, Theodore had had a very close relationship with Edith Caro. That's right. Who was a family friend, a childhood neighbor whom he had grown up with. Some people thought that he and Edith had an understanding about their future together, but all that was forgotten as Theodore aggressively wooed Alice Lee. That's right. She is in the audience to watch him compete in the 1879 Harvard Lightweight Boxing Championship when he delivered, quote, a tremendous thrashing to his first opponent before losing to the defending champion in a, quote, distinctly gory final bout. Now, when Theodore first proposed to Alice, she doesn't accept but he's not to be dissuaded. He continues his courtship for another eight months until finally, quote, after much pleading, she agreed to marry him. And their engagement is going to be announced Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1880, and their wedding set for Theodore's 22nd birthday, October 27th, 1880. That's right. In between those two dates, he's going to graduate from Harvard, ranking 21st out of a class of 177 students. The wedding was held in Boston, and then the newlyweds spent some time alone at the Roosevelt's Oyster Bay home. And then the following spring, they're going to take a trip to Europe, Alice's first, Theodore's third at this point. Yeah. And when he's there, he is going to climb the 15,000-foot summit of the Matterhorn. Impressive. Just a little excursion in the honeymoon of Theodore Roosevelt. That's just it. Now, during his courtship, Theodore is going to give up plans for a career as a naturalist, which would have required him to pursue graduate studies at a European university. And instead, he's going to turn his eye to politics. Hmm. He had excelled in classes on politics and economics and wrote his senior thesis on the practicability of equal rights for women and declared his intention to, quote, try to help the cause of better government in New York City. Following along this uh, line, he's going to enroll at Columbia Law School, where he makes an impression for his spirited opinions on legal issues but he shows little inclination toward the actual practice of law as a profession. Yeah, well, he's got a lot of other things going on. While he's at Columbia, he is researching and writing a scholarly work of history, The Naval War of 1812, Yeah, which he's going to publish in 1882. It is very well received, and it becomes part of the growing national conversation leading to a new national policy of naval modernization. That's it. Our listeners will remember uh, mentions of this during Garfield, Arthur, Cleveland, and Harrison. Uh, mm -hmm. We're trying to oh, yeah. get our Navy up to shit. That is all going to be culminating in Theodore Roosevelt, perhaps the most, the biggest naval enthusiast president we will have seen yet. That's just it. Within a few years, there's a copy of this book aboard every U.S. Navy vessel. That's right. It, it's basically a handbook for the U.S. Navy. I mean, they gotta know all about it. Young Theodore, he's not just a historian, he's trying to become a politician. He begins attending meetings at his local Republican Party headquarters, learning the ins and outs of politics, and his family... Yeah, this is much to the chagrin of his family. Yeah, they are appalled. Because in the eyes of these blue-blooded, high-society families like the Roosevelt's, politics is a dirty business. Yeah, it's for shifty-eyed 
crooks. That's right. It's best left to the lower classes. And members of the extended Roosevelt family are going to be turning up their noses at Theodore for years after he enters politics. Right. In 1881, the New York Republican machine undergoes convulsions when Senator Roscoe Conkling resigns in an attempt to upstage President James Garfield, who was then, of course, assassinated by a deranged office seeker, as our listeners will remember from episode 20. And that's going to be the environment that Theodore steps into. You got Joe Murray, a career politician in New York City. He's looking to thumb his nose at the Republican boss above him, trying to find a alternate candidate to defeat the boss candidate he prevails upon the young reform-minded theodore roosevelt in this environment where reform is popular yep tr agrees to stand for the party's nomination to the state assembly's 21st district that's right and murray is going to whip up the votes for roosevelt to not only win the nomination but in a heavily republican district He's going to cruise to victory in the election. He leaves law school without graduating, and he's headed to Albany. That's right, and at the age of 24, he is the youngest member of the New York State Legislature, and his upper-class pedigree is going to make him a target of ridicule by some veteran politicians. That's right. You got one Tammany Hall Democrat, John McManus, who was a former prize fighter, He's going to make fun of T.R.'s side whiskers, and T.R.'s going to get right up in his face and say, quote, you better leave me alone or I'll kick you, I'll bite you, I'll kick you in the balls. Yeah. T.R., not holding back. That's right. Fierce. You got another Tammany Hall Democrat who's going to make fun of his jacket one day in a saloon, and as one witness put it, quote, Teddy knocked him down, and he got up and he hit him again, and when he got up, he hit him again. And he said, now you go over there and wash yourself. When you are in the presence of gentlemen, conduct yourself like a gentleman. Yeah, what a badass. That's right, and he's not going to waste any time making a name for himself on the floor of the assembly, where he's going to introduce several bills to reform New York City's government, and he's going to call for a corruption investigation into state Supreme Court Justice Theodoric Westbrook, whom he accused of abusing his judicial powers to enable robber baron Jay Gold to take over a Manhattan railroad. Yeah, that's some pretty serious shit. And Roosevelt is on the verge of securing a committee recommendation to impeach Westbrook when some committee members were bribed to change their votes. Though this ends the investigation, Roosevelt has exposed blatant corruption. And he wins high praise in the newspapers. He's easily reelected to a second one-year term, and he's chosen by his colleagues as the Republican minority leader. Wow. He's now party leader in just his second term is, what, 25 years old? Yeah, it's pretty impressive. He's going to begin working with the newly elected Democratic governor, Grover Cleveland, You may remember him from a couple episodes. They worked together to enact a civil service reform bill. TR is also going to vote in favor of a bill to reduce fares on Jay Gold's aforementioned railroad. But when Cleveland vetoed the bill on the grounds that it violated the contract's cause of the Constitution, Roosevelt is going to change his vote and back Cleveland's veto arguing that the legislature should not exceed its powers even for the good cause of reining in, quote, the wealthy criminal class. That's it. We got the big one and the dude here. Teaming up for the first time. Cleveland later recalls, quote, it was clear to me, even thus early, that he was looking to a public career, that he was studying political conditions with a care that I have never known any man to show, and that he was firmly convinced that he would one day reach prominence. That's Cleveland on TR. Hmm. Roosevelt's going to win a third one-year term, and with Republicans securing a majority, he comes within a hair's breadth of becoming Speaker of the Assembly, losing narrowly to the party machine's candidate. 
Instead, he's going to become chairman of the powerful Cities Committee, and his supporters control most of the Assembly's important committees. That's right. He's going to successfully propose a drastic reform of New York City's government by stripping the board of aldermen of its power to confirm the mayor's appointments. This is going to deny the notoriously corrupt aldermen their control over the city's patronage and lodge that power solely in the mayor who was more directly accountable to the voters. Yeah, this is pretty huge mm -hmm. because things were like really fucking dirty and it needed to stop. Yeah. You know, and he's, uh, you know, putting a dent in it. Certainly. He's also going to launch a massive corruption investigation into New York city's government and cover more widespread abuses of power. And that's going to lead to the passage of seven more reform bills. That's it. When Grover Cleveland governor turns out to veto a few of those bills over technical details, Roosevelt is outraged and the unlikely partnership of these two future presidents is going to come to an end. That's it. You got young Theodore Roosevelt with his political star in ascendancy. He's going to be brought low by a terrible family tragedy. That's just it. One of the worst days in the life of any man who would become president. Now, of course, you'll recall a Valentine's Day that we mentioned in yep. this episode. The announcement of his engagement. And here's another one. Four years, years later. later. Yeah, four years later. He's in Albany, February 13th, 1884, when he receives a telegram informing him that he's a father. Alice was doing, quote, fairly well after giving birth to a healthy baby girl, also named Alice. Hours later, however, a second telegram informed him that both his wife and his mother were dying. Wow. He boards a train and races to the family's Manhattan townhouse where he arrived in time to say goodbye before Mitty Roosevelt died of typhoid fever at 3 a.m. on February 14th at the age of 48. Alice, meanwhile, was suffering from an undiagnosed kidney failure and she dies in her husband's arms at 2 p.m. the same day in the same house at the age of 22. The sudden losses shock Roosevelt into a stunned, dazed state. His diary entry for that day contains a single black X and the words, the light has gone out of my life. How can he come back? Well, it's going to be tough. Yeah, his grief over Alice's death is going to be so great that he is not going to be able to even acknowledge her existence going That's forward. Yeah. He writes a couple of real brief memorials, and after that, he will never mention her name again. She is not mentioned in his autobiography, and he is never once going to discuss her at all with their daughter. That's it. His I daughter, mean, Alice, not going to hear a word about her mother no. from her father, I mean, that's ever. pretty intense. Uh, Edmund Morris is later going to put it, quote, Like a lion obsessively trying to drag a spear from its flank, Roosevelt set about dislodging Alice Lee from his soul, suppressing his grief until the memory was too dead to throb. And... Furthermore, he's going to show little interest in his newborn daughter, who was placed in the care of his unmarried sister, Bamie. Yep, he's going to deal with his pain by throwing himself even more aggressively into his work. He keeps up a frenetic workaholic pace during the final months of the assembly session, and then he's going to decline to stand for re-election to a fourth term. He's going to attend the state Republican convention that is going to choose New York's delegation to the 1884 Republican National Convention, the front runners for president being New York's own incumbent, President Chester Arthur, 
and former House Speaker and Secretary of State James G. Blaine. But Roosevelt? Gonna go a different way. That's it. He's supporting Vermont Senator George Edmonds, a dull but honest reform-minded Republican. TR goes to the state convention and he's gonna play Arthur and Blaine supporters off against one another and secure the selection of himself and three other Edmonds men to the New York delegation. Yeah, pretty shrewd work on the part of TR. At the National Convention in Chicago, he forms a lasting bond with Henry Cabot Lodge, soon to be an influential congressman from Massachusetts, with the two maneuvering to position Edmonds as the compromise choice in the event of a deadlocked convention. We know all about deadlocked conventions. Yeah, that strategy has worked many times before. That's just it. Roosevelt is going to make waves by forcefully arguing that the convention should break its tradition of accepting the Republican National Committee's choice for convention chairman and instead choose John Lynch, an African-American congressman from Mississippi. He prevails, and Lynch is elected chairman. But despite Roosevelt's strenuous efforts, the convention quickly turns into a landslide for Blaine, who was reviled by reformers as an emblem of corruption. Yep, Roosevelt initially declines to say whether he would support Blaine in the general election, and then he ends up earning the ire of his fellow reformers when he eventually did maintain party loyalty and express support for Blaine. Yeah. But by the time James G. Blaine is going to lose the general election to the Democratic nominee, Grover Cleveland, mm -hmm. Theodore Roosevelt will have already become a full-fledged cattle rancher in the badlands of North Dakota. Another intense shift in the life of TR. And it's not going to be a surprise moving forward. This, this guy did it all. Mm -hmm. Well, and he's been out to North Dakota before. That's it. I mean, he's no stranger to roughing it. During his Harvard years, he spent summers hunting and hiking in the wilderness of northern Maine. After graduation, he goes on a six-week hunting expedition with his brother Elliot through Minnesota, Indiana, and Illinois. In 1883, he went on a grueling expedition in the Dakota Territory, where he killed a buffalo, earned the grudging respect of seasoned frontiersmen, and impulsively made a huge investment in the region's burgeoning cattle ranching business. Now, this is a guy who's going out there with frontiersman clothes on, but he's got Tiffany cufflinks, mm -hmm. and they're ribbing him about it. Yeah. So he's out to prove himself yet again, and by God, he's set to do it. Yep. Well, you know, a year later, he is now freshly widowed, and he's out of politics, so he's going to return to the Dakotas full-time and dedicate himself to cattle ranching. Yep. He builds a ranch, which he names Elkhorn, and he hires two old friends, his old woodsman buddies from Maine, to run it for him. And then for the next three years, he's going to spend most of his time out west. He'll take some occasional trips back to New York, but he's in the Badlands. The Badlands, of course, classically described as hell with the fires burned out. That's it. This is still the Wild West at the time. It is rampant with outlaws and horse thieves. Lawmen are few and sometimes hundreds of miles far between. Yeah, they should make a Red Dead 3 and just make Teddy Roosevelt the main guy. Yeah, wouldn't be too far from the truth. And uh, he got into a lot of classic Wild West type incidents out there. He surely did. There was one memorable incident in a saloon which Teddy recorded. Quote, I was out after lost horses. It was late in the evening when I reached the place. I heard one or two shots in the bar room as I came up, and I disliked going in. But there was nowhere else to go, and it was a cold night. Inside the room were several men who, including the bartender, were wearing the kind of smile worn by men who are making believe to like what they don't like. A shabby individual in a broad hat with a cocked gun in each hand was walking up and down the floor, talking with strident profanity. 
He had evidently been shooting at the clock, which had two or three holes in its face. As soon as he saw me, he hailed me as Four Eyes in reference to my spectacles and said, Four Eyes is going to treat. I joined in the laugh and got behind the stove and sat down, seeking to escape notice. He followed me, however, and though I tried to pass it off as a jest, this merely made him more offensive, and he stood leaning over me, a gun in each hand, using very foul language. In response to his reiterated command that I should set up the drinks, I said, Well, I've got to, I've got to, and rose, looking past him. As I rose, I struck quick and hard with my right, just to one side of the point of his jaw, hitting him with my left as I straightened out, and then again with my right. He fired the guns, but I do not know whether this was merely a convulsive action of his hands, or whether he was trying to shoot me. When he went down, he struck the corner of the bar with his head, and he was senseless. I took away his guns, and the other people in the room, who were now loud in their denunciation of him, hustled him out and put him in the shed. Wow. Yeah, what an account. <clears throat> yep. Teddy Roosevelt, two cocked pistols at him, knocks the guy out. Right. He a bad man. This city boy acquitting himself well in the Wild West. That's it. Not letting anyone get in his face. On another occasion, his boat was stolen from his ranch, and he and two friends built a makeshift boat and chased the thieves a hundred miles down the Little Missouri River, capturing them at gunpoint and escorting them another hundred and fifty miles downriver through treacherous ice flows to the nearest town where they faced criminal charges. So yeah, Teddy Roosevelt is willing to travel 250 miles on a makeshift boat through treacherous ice flows to bring you to justice. That's right. Do not fuck with this guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when they captured these guys, it, it was so cold that they could not like tie their hands together because the, their, they would have like died of hypothermia. So they had to hold yeah, them at crazy. gunpoint, worried that at any moment these guys could like attack us back. Yeah. But he wasn't about to let him go. No, that's it. He's going to earn great respect out West due to incidents like these, coupled with his reputation for unflinching honor and honesty and his tireless readiness to undertake backbreaking physical labor. He is always a man to push himself on mm -hmm. all fronts. Yeah, he's not just like some rich investor who comes out west he's right there right next to all of his ranch hands doing all the labor that's it they'd look at him and they see a guy in glasses that has like tiffany cuff links and shit and mm -hmm. they're like oh this weakling mm -hmm. this worm and then he turns around and really shows them what's what mm -hmm. i mean the guy is a true true badass in every sense of the word mm -hmm. he's gonna serve as a deputy sheriff he organizes the Little Missouri Stockman's Association, and he's considered the obvious candidate for the U.S. Senate should North Dakota be granted statehood. He no. writes and publishes two more books, one, Hunting Trips of a Ranchman, which, quote, was soon accepted as a standard textbook of big game hunting in the United States, and a biography of Mississippi Senator Thomas Hart Benton, which he was commissioned to write as a part of a series of biographies of American statesmen in which he highlighted Benton's belief in manifest destiny. We know all about that from episode 11. And this is a belief that T.R. shares. That's right. His buddy Henry Cabot Lodge helped hook him up with that commission to write that book. Indeed. T.R.'s career as a rancher is going to come to an end after the winter of 1886 to 87, when a devastating blizzard will result in the deaths of about 80% of the cattle across the entire region. Yeah. He's going to lose... A crazy, crazy disaster. Yeah. He loses about 60% of his own cattle. He sells off the rest of his ranching interests, ultimately losing about half of the $80,000 he invested. Yeah, it's a, it's a really rough time for mm -hmm. farmers. In, in America. Yeah. It, this was a true calamity. Mm -hmm. The likes of which we've not seen since. 
you know, it really devastated the entire region. Yeah. TR had inherited a large sum of money when his father died, but he was not particularly savvy with money. Namely, this very impulsive, huge investment in cattle ranching. That's the thing. Yeah, he's very brash and very impulsive. He mm -hmm. has the money to do these things, but he's not necessarily smart about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, after this uh, disaster, things are going to be a little bit tighter for him because he's got trouble living within his means. And now he also he just built a very large and expensive home on Long Island at Oyster Bay. His great Sagamore Hill estate. That's it. That's going to serve him well for the rest of his life. But leave him strapped for cash at this moment. And he's going to need to get his finances in order because he has a secret. And it's one that not even his closest family members know. It's that he is engaged to be married once bum, again. Bum, bum. And we'll find out who he's going to marry right after these words from our sponsors. The Dead Presidents Podcast is brought to you in part by Bayer Pharmaceutical Products, which is proud to introduce heroin hydrochloride. Bayer's heroin hydrochloride is preeminently adapted for the manufacture of cough elixirs, cough drops, cough lozenges, and cough medicines of any kind. Price $4.85 per ounce in one-ounce packages, less in larger quantities. The efficient dose being very small, it is the cheapest specific on the market for the relief of coughs and bronchitis. Listeners, we know you've tried weak cough drops that don't really work, but have you ever tried cough drops with heroin in them? I had a bad case of bronchitis, but once I started using cough drops made with Bayer heroin, the feelings of discomfort in my throat have completely dissipated. In fact, I haven't felt anything at all. And it's awesome. My bronchitis is a thing of the past. But I'm going to go ahead and keep using these cough drops several times a day, every day, just to keep any future cases of bronchitis at bay. Play it safe. Start using Bayer Heroin Hydrochloride today. That's a message from our sponsor, Bayer Pharmaceutical Products. We're also proud to be sponsored by the Santa Fe Railroad, which has an exciting message for our listeners about opportunities abounding in Oklahoma. From poverty to competence. That, in brief, is the history of many persons who have gone to Oklahoma after vainly trying to gain a living elsewhere. If you have not succeeded, why not investigate what Oklahoma offers? Write to C.L. Seagraves, passenger agent for the Santa Fe Railroad, to receive a timetable folder and a pamphlet, The Truth About Oklahoma. Homeseeker excursion tickets are on sale the first and third Tuesdays of each month. It's time for our listeners to face facts. Take a look in the mirror. You have to admit that the person staring back at you is pretty much a complete and total failure. You've always sucked at life. But it's not your fault. It's not that you're an incompetent, good-for-nothing derelict. It's just that you don't live in Oklahoma. Trying to get by anywhere else is a losing proposition. But Oklahoma is a land of milk and honey. You wouldn't believe how many useless deadbeats can cross into Oklahoma and become overnight successes. Life is hard. Oklahoma is easy. Book your ticket today. That's a message from our sponsor, the Santa Fe Railroad. That sure sounds promising, James. And now a word from our sponsor, the Children's Home Society. We have on hand a very fine lot of boys of all ages from one month to 12 years of age. We are putting them out in carefully selected homes. They are placed on three months trial. All it costs to get one is the transportation. References are required. For terms, address the superintendent of the Children's Home Society, the Reverend C.C. C. Stallman, 810 Olive Street, 
St. Louis, Missouri. Listeners, there are lots of unfortunate young boys out there in need of a good home. If you're willing to provide a good home, or if you want to get your hands on a young boy for some other reason, write to the Children's Home Society immediately. If you can convince kindly old Reverend Stallman that your references are legit, all you have to do is pay for a train ticket from St. Louis, and you can have a friendless young boy sent to your home for a three-month trial period before any questions are asked. Who could pass up that opportunity? That's a message from our sponsor, the Children's Home Society. And now, back to the show. And we're back, ready to delve in to a secret that Teddy Roosevelt had kept even from those closest to him. He's engaged to be married. Yeah, when he's, uh, you know, spending a lot of time out west, but he's taking trips back to New York, he's getting some business done in New York. In October 1885, he rekindled his early romance with Edith Caro. Edith was attractive, intelligent, educated, refined, as well as intensely private and self-disciplined. Within a short time, Theodore had proposed to her, and she accepted. But they kept their engagement secret because polite society would be scandalized by the thought of Theodore remarrying so soon after Alice's death. It's yeah. just uh, about a year and a half afterwards. Right. He's getting engaged. You gotta keep that under wraps. That's it. They're gonna schedule their wedding to take place quietly in December 1886 in London, where Edith's mother and sister had moved after her father's death. The plans were threatened in October 1886 when Theodore was constrained to accept the Republican nomination for mayor of New York, with no one aware of the impending nuptials. He runs a hard-fought campaign but he's kind of considered a long shot because Democrats, they'd been in ascendancy and many Republicans voted for the Democratic candidate to stave off the startlingly viable independent candidacy of socialist labor activist Henry George, who predicted that the French Revolution would soon be reenacted on American soil. Ouch. Yep, TR's in a tough three-way race. And he is going to be pretty bitter following his third place finish in that race. Mm. But as soon as the election ends, he's going to get on board a ship to London. And as he embarks into the Atlantic, his engagement announcement will be hitting the newspapers in New York. That's it. And uh, just a side note, it's not the last three-way race that TR is going to see. No. Nope. He and Edith are going to be married on December 2nd, 1886. He is age 28 and she 25. They will then embark on a 15-week tour of Europe, and when they return to the United States, baby Alice is transferred from the care of Aunt Bamie to her father and new stepmother, who's already pregnant. That's right. Theodore Roosevelt III, also known as Ted Jr., is going to be born in 1887, and four more children, Kermit, Ethel, Archibald, and Quentin, will be added within the next ten years. That's it. A growing family for T.R. bouncing back from the tragedy to create a whole new family for himself. That's it. And we've already talked about some of his published works, but at this point... T.R.'s going to kind of start himself on the path of a literary career. Democrats are in control of New York City, New York State, and the White House. Roosevelt has few political prospects, and he focuses instead on his literary endeavors. He's going to write another biography in the American Statesman series, this time on Governor Morris, number three on our top five constitutional convention delegates, as you'll remember. And he begins 
what he envisions as his magnum opus, a multi-volume history of westward expansion. We're going back to Manifest Destiny. Going back to Polk. Well, it's a subject he knows a lot about in an area that he's experienced firsthand. And the first two volumes of The Winning of the West are going to be published in 1889 to excellent reviews. Volumes 3 and 4 will follow in 1894 and 96. He's also going to publish A History of New York City and continue his writings on Big Game Hunting, which will be collected into two more books. Got a lot more great game hunting stories. That's it. He's got a lot of epic tales to tell. And boy, does he spin the yarns. In one hunting trip to Montana in 1889, he shot a grizzly bear through the lungs and tracked it into a thicket where he suddenly found himself face to face with it. The bear charged at him and he shot it in the chest, but it kept coming. It kept charging, and at the last second, Teddy Roosevelt leapt to the side and fired off one more round, the bullet entering the bear's open mouth and the bear crashing to the ground dead. Wow. Right out of a movie. Indeed. Teddy Roosevelt. That's Teddy Roosevelt's real life. And, you know, you, you got to remember, we just said that during this whole time, he's writing books and having kids. Yeah. So this is all happening concurrently. Mm-hmm. He's got a lot of irons in the fire. He sure does. And another one of those that he does is uh, he begins serious uh, efforts in conservation. That's right. He spends a lot of time hunting out west, and he's finding that the western wildlife is being depleted at a much faster rate than he would have expected. So he's going to form a conservation society called the Boone and Crockett Club. He will become its president and its membership is going to include many prominent hunters, scientists, and politicians. And this club is going to very effectively lobby the federal government. And it will be instrumental in the creation of the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. Also the passage of the Park Protection Act of 1894, which, quote, saved Yellowstone from ecological destruction. Mm -hmm. And also the Forest Reserve Act of 1891, which empowers the president to set aside public lands as forest reserves, and which, spoiler alert, President Theodore Roosevelt is going to use to quadruple the nation's forest reserves from 50 million to 200 million acres. Yeah, I think this is one of his best legacies. Yeah. Is the National Park. Certainly his conservation efforts as president, you can see here how he's laying the foundation for that yeah. as a private citizen. This is going to lead to Civil Service Commission. Roosevelt's political career is going to resume upon Benjamin Harrison's election to the presidency. We all remember that now from the Harrison episode. In 1889, Harrison appoints him as one of three members of the Civil Service Commission, charged with oversight and administration of the Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act, which subjects a growing number of federal job appointments to merit examinations and bars mandatory campaign contributions from federal employees. Most members of Congress and the President's administration, the dispensers of the federal patronage, are content with lackluster enforcement of civil service rules. Though his two commissioner colleagues had a do-nothing approach to the job, Roosevelt goes into it intending, like he does with every, everything else, to make waves. And boy does he. Now these commissioners had very little actual power. In the event they found violations of the law, they could only refer the matter to the applicable cabinet secretary for further action. But Roosevelt is a master at generating newspaper headlines, and he is going to use his position to publicly shame his superiors into action. Yeah, again, just a badass. Yeah, he's going to, like, barge in there at the New York Customs House and start uncovering fraud in the merit examinations. He's going to be recommending the termination and prosecution of the officials responsible. 
And people start looking around like, whoa, like what? Who is this guy? Yeah. This isn't what we we're expecting. And then he's going to take on the biggest culprit of civil service corruption, that being the post office. And he's going to make an enemy of Postmaster General John Wanamaker, who is using patronage for political advantage. Roosevelt found corrupt postal hiring practices in President Harrison's hometown of Indianapolis, and he uncovers systemic hiring fraud in the Milwaukee post office. Yeah, I mean, he's going to town. He is going to investigate patronage abuses on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota, and he recommends the expansion of civil service rules to cover all appointments to the Indian Bureau. But the Harrison administration is going to fail to act on that. The administration wished he would go away, but he's just too popular to just shit can. Yeah. You can't just kick him out. Mm -hmm. He's making waves. That's right. You don't want to do anything, but if you fire the guy who's pointing out all the bad stuff, it just makes you look worse. Right. President Harrison is going to be struggling to secure his renomination in 1892, and Roosevelt is going to be on the scene for the selection of national convention delegates in Baltimore, where he will identify 25 postal employees using their positions for electioneering in violation of the civil service rules. Can you imagine something so brazen happening today? He stands up and names 25 people that are being shady, you know? Yeah. It's just wild. And the Postmaster General is going to ignore his recommendations and conduct its own investigation to try to whitewash the incident. So TR is going to demand a House of Representatives investigation. So and, not too much different from today. <laughs> well, the House is going to side with Roosevelt and embarrass Postmaster General Wanamaker. It's pretty big. Mm-hmm. Grover Cleveland is going to return to office, replacing Harrison for his second non-consecutive presidential term, and he's going to retain Roosevelt on the commission, which is required to have a bipartisan composition. Still a cool move, considering they kind of had a falling out. Mm -hmm. Well, during his years on the commission, Roosevelt is going to live primarily in Washington, D.C. for the first time in his life, and he's going to make many friends among Washington high society, including House Speaker Thomas Reed, future Secretary of State John Hay, and the historian Henry Adams, who is, of course, the grandson and great-grandson of presidents. That's it. Adams would write that, quote, Roosevelt, more than any other man, showed the singular primitive quality that belongs to ultimate matter, the quality that medieval theology assigned to God. He was pure act. Some pretty epic words. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, un it's not all going to be sunshine and rainbows, as it never is. Uh, these years are also going to see some family troubles involving Theodore's younger brother, Elliot, who is descending into alcoholism. He's squandering his inheritance, and he's scandalizing his wife and children. Now... T.R. is head of the family, so he attempts to manage the situation from afar and get his brother into a sanitarium, but Elliot just won't stay put. When a servant girl claimed to be carrying Elliot's child while Elliot's wife was also pregnant, Theodore was disgusted by his brother's disgraceful conduct and argued that he should be separated from his wife and children, the eldest of those children, being future First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt. When the servant girl's child was born with a striking resemblance to Elliot, Yikes. the family quietly settled the threatened paternity suit, possibly paying as much as $10,000. A lot of a money. A pretty hefty sum for mm -hmm. the time. Theodore is forced to make the family drama public when he files a lawsuit to have Elliot declared insane which Elliot settled by agreeing to give up control of his finances for two years and enter a sanitarium. Soon, Elliot's wife dies, and he leaves treatment, only to take up with another mistress, sinking deeper into alcoholism 
until he attempts suicide by leaping out of a window, surviving the fall, only to die from a seizure the next day. Crazy shit. Wow. Their sister, Corrine, recalled that when Theodore saw their brother's corpse, he, quote, was more overcome than I have ever seen him and cried like a little child for a long time. Wow. We're seeing a pattern of epic deeds and tragic circumstances in T.R.'s life here. All of which would have molded him into the truly great American that he was. You know? That's right. Well, what's his next move? He's spent six years on the Civil Service Commission. He's ready for a new challenge. So when the new Republican mayor of New York offered him an appointment on the four-man board of police commissioners, he accepts. And he takes office in, in May 1895. He gets chosen as president of the board of police commissioners, but that really gives him no greater power than his fellow commissioners. But he's going to initially dominate the board through his energy force of personality, and once again his flair for generating newspaper headlines. He vowed to reform the notoriously corrupt police force, which extorted bribes in the form of protection money throughout the city and sold badges and promotions to the highest bidder. That's just it. Thomas Burns is the powerful chief of police who had grown suspiciously rich during his tenure. He promptly retires, rather than face investigation. Upon taking office, T.R.'s going to walk around the city all night. He'll, he'll catch officers sleeping, drinking, or otherwise neglecting their beat. He's being bad. Mm -hmm. He's starting to crack down. He's not screwing around. Fear of his surprise inspections is going to sharply increase the police force's attention to duty. He's going to spearhead major reforms, instituting regular physical exams and firearms inspections, and implementing hiring and promotions practices based on merit rather than political connections and graft. So he's trying to change a pretty dirty system, as he has been all along. That's right. And he's also going to demand strict enforcement of the law banning Sunday alcohol sales, which had previously been pretty much totally ignored. It was only selectively enforced against bar owners who were lax in paying their protection money or political contributions. Yeah. Now, Roosevelt is not a prohibitionist, but he believes the best way to get rid of a bad law is to enforce it strictly. That's it. So, so he's got the Sunday liquor crackdown. That's right. And that's going to earn him some grudging respect as well as the support of the temperance movement. But it's pretty widely unpopular, especially with the German immigrant communities. And it's believed to have cost the Republican Party the 1895 elections for citywide offices, despite the party's victory in statewide elections. Yeah, well, he's not... In a popularity contest. That's it. He doesn't care. He's going to do what he feels is right. Now, the Board of Police Commissioners was also in charge of overseeing elections. And though the police had often abused their power to tip election outcomes, the elections held during Roosevelt's tenure were the cleanest in memory. But as he continued into his second year, the Board of Commissioners became mired in deadlock. That's right, James. The law requires the unanimous vote of all four commissioners on many matters, including promotions, and one Democratic commissioner, Andrew Parker, resolved to grind Roosevelt's reform agenda to a halt. Roosevelt is going to be successful in having the mayor find Parker guilty of neglect of duty, but the governor overturned the conviction, and Parker remained in office. That's right. Well, that's going to bring us up to the election of 1896. As you may recall right. from our finale last season, when Ohio Governor William McKinley won the 1896 Republican presidential nomination, 
Roosevelt saw his chance to escape the deadlock in New York and return to national office. Though he had favored his old friend, Speaker Thomas Reed, for the nomination, he immediately became an enthusiastic McKinley supporter and hit the campaign trail to speak on his behalf. Now the Democratic nominee, Nebraska Representative William Jennings Bryan, he's a free silver advocate with populist appeal. Mark Hanna, the immensely powerful Republican Party chairman, schedules Roosevelt to trail Bryan through the battleground Midwest, believing him, quote, ideal foil to the Democratic candidate, an Easterner whom Westerners revered, an intellectual who could explain the complexities of the gold standard in terms a cowboy could understand. Sounds like a pretty politically powerful combination of characteristics here. That's just it. This Roosevelt guy might have a future in campaigning across the country. That's right. And, of course, after McKinley wins the election, Roosevelt's friends, including Henry Cabot Lodge, are going to lobby McKinley heavily to appoint him Assistant Secretary of the Navy. McKinley is initially hesitant because he is kind of worried that Roosevelt's a bit of a war hawk. And he's already got a reputation for, quote, always getting into rows with everybody. Now, the incoming Navy Secretary, former Massachusetts Governor John D. Long, he brings a laid-back, laissez-faire attitude to his post and initially fears that the energetic Roosevelt is going to seek to dominate the department. But Roosevelt is going to eventually win him over by signaling his willingness to remain in Washington all summer, thus enabling Long to take extended leaves of absence. Yeah, now, how about that? That's how he gets Long on board to have him as assistant. Yeah. If you get me, you can go on vacation and I'll just hold down the fort. Right. Sounds like a pretty good deal for Long. Yeah. Oh, but then you got Senator Thomas Platt, New York's Republican machine boss, who just so happens to hate Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah. But he's going to consent to this appointment in order to get TR out of New York. That's right. They pretty much, they want him the hell out of town. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, go ahead. Give him that. Sure. Get him out of here. So Long and Platt are both on board. McKinley nominates Roosevelt as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. He's confirmed by the Senate. In April 1897. That's just it. Now, McKinley's prior worry that old T.R. is a warmonger is not completely unfounded. No. Nope. Teddy Roosevelt is a staunch advocate of American intervention in Cuba, where Cuban rebels are fighting for independence from Spain. Privately, he had even expressed a desire that the United States would go to war with Britain and conquer Canada. Yep, this is a guy who's kind of secretly ashamed that his father didn't fight in the Civil War. He just wants to fight. He doesn't care where it's at. He just wants to fight. The famous novelist Henry James considered him, quote, a dangerous and ominous jingo. Mm. Roosevelt had said in 1896, quote, there is an unhappy tendency among certain of our cultivated people to lose the great manly virtues, the power to strive and fight and conquer. Yeah, that's it. TR is of the belief that it's going to strengthen the national character for the U.S. to flex its muscles in war. And he makes clear his intent to fight on the front lines of any such war. That's so, right. Now he's joining the Navy Department, and he's going to push for immediate expansion of naval power. In a major speech at the Navy War College, he maintains that being prepared for war is the best way to promote peace, and argues that, quote, no nation can hold its place in the world or can do any work really worth doing unless it stands ready to guard its rights with an armed hand. Wow. Roosevelt is going to frequent Washington's Metropolitan Club, where he joins a 
social circle of powerful men who believe in America's manifest destiny to dominate the Western Hemisphere. His friends include Navy Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan, whose 1890 book The Influence of Sea Power on History was itself so influential that it sparked a global naval arms race. Yeah. And he's also friends with one Commodore George Dewey, a naval officer who's craving an opportunity to unleash the upgraded U.S. Navy in battle. That's it. T.R. is going to strongly urge U.S. annexation of Hawaii, and he applauds when McKinley negotiates an annexation treaty in June 1897. Now, Japan protests, and Roosevelt said publicly that, quote, the United States is not in a position which requires her to ask Japan or any other foreign power what territory it shall or shall not acquire. Wow. Newspapers are going to accuse Roosevelt of, quote, distinct impropriety for speaking on matters that are within the State Department's purview, and Navy Secretary Long is going to be upset by the negative headlines, but McKinley is eventually going to tell Roosevelt that he was quite right to quit criticize Japan. That's right. I mean, T.R. never won to hold back his feelings. No. Or mince words. He is going to be taking advantage of Long's frequent absences to put the Navy on a war footing, and he commissions a revised Navy war plan that envisions strikes against Spanish holdings in the Caribbean and the Pacific. When a retirement goes on to create a vacancy in the command of the Navy's Asiatic Squadron, Roosevelt warns Dewey that a senator was recommending a rival candidate, and this prompts a different senator to meet with McKinley on Dewey's behalf, resulting in McKinley giving the command straight over to Dewey. Yeah, this vacancy opens up, and Roosevelt, from his perch at the War or Navy Department, sees, you know, a senator is going to talk to McKinley about this other candidate, so he calls up Dewey, and he's like, do you know any senators? <laughs> And he yeah. makes sure that someone else recommends Dewey, and before Long can even, like, figure out what's going on, yeah. Dewey gets the appointment. Yeah, that's it. Uh, with fateful consequences. That's exactly right. And another damn near close to Valentine's Day incident here in mm -hmm. the life of TR, February 15th, 1898, the USS Maine explodes off the coast of Cuba resulting in the deaths of 261 American sailors. You'll recall this from episode 25. Now, on February 25th, while the Navy's investigation was pending, and while Secretary Long was out sick without any authorization whatsoever, Roosevelt issues orders to Navy squadrons across the globe to, quote, keep full of coal and be ready for a declaration of war, including his famous order to Dewey that, quote, your duty will be to see that the Spanish squadron does not leave the Asiatic coast, then offensive operations in the Philippine Islands, end quote. When Congress authorizes $50 million for war preparations, Roosevelt aggressively purchases merchant ships that could be converted into warships. On March 28th, the Navy investigation concluded that the main explosion was caused by an external mine, not by internal failure. And when McKinley continued to drag his feet on declaring war, Roosevelt privately complained, quote, McKinley has no more backbone than a chocolate eclair. Yeah, some harsh words, but we talked about what was going on with that in episode 25. McKinley doesn't want to rush headlong into war. He's hesitant to do it. But we talked about the William Randolph Hearst press mm -hmm. really kind of dictating the public sentiment mm -hmm. and kind of pushing him into a corner. Yeah. And then you have TR saying stuff like that. 
So yeah, and I mean, you got guys like TR who want to rush headlong into war. Exactly, and, and now's his chance. That's it, because war is finally declared in April, and when that happens, against the pleading of his wife and many of his friends, Theodore Roosevelt resigns from the Navy Department and volunteers for Army service at the age of thirty-nine. That's it. This is the glory that he's been seeking. Yeah, everyone's Is he going to get it. Yeah, everyone's telling him like you're you know, you're so great at this Navy department job. The Navy's like so important. You can do much better work here. You're crazy and he's like no way. Like yeah. I'm going in. Yeah, that's just it. So, this is going to lead us to the Spanish-American War. War Secretary Russell Alger offers him command of the 1st Volunteer Cavalry Regiment, but Roosevelt asks to serve as lieutenant colonel under his friend, Colonel Leonard Wood, who had won the Medal of Honor fighting against Apaches and was one of McKinley's personal physicians. Wood and Roosevelt are inundated with applications to join the regiment, and they enlist a diverse roster that includes Ivy Leaguers, upscale gentlemen, college athletes, cowboys, hunters, frontiersmen, and Native Americans, a real boiling pot, mm -hmm. as it were. Newspapers uh, flouted various nicknames for the regiment, but the one that stuck was the Rough Riders. That's right. They're going to undergo a month of training in San Antonio before proceeding to Tampa, where they embark aboard ship for Cuba, though inadequate transports are going to force them to leave most of their horses behind. That's right. They were There were actually times where they were arguing whether or not certain people should be on board in exchange for horses. Mm -hmm. It was a mess. Yep, Commodore Dewey has already destroyed the Spanish Asiatic fleet at the Battle of Manila Bay, and the Navy has the Spanish Caribbean fleet blockaded in the harbor of the critical Cuban city of Santiago. That's just it. Off to a pretty strong start. Yep. On June 23rd, the Army lands at a village 14 miles southeast of Santiago, and they begin marching through hilly jungle terrain in scorching heat. Spanish troops in the vicinity are falling back towards Santiago when on June 24th, the Cavalry Corps commander, General Joseph Fighting Joe Wheeler, a former Confederate general, orders an attack. The Rough Riders come under fire from snipers, but Roosevelt rallies his men to return fire, pushing the snipers back and opening the way for an American charge that forces the Spanish to retreat. The Battle of Las Guasimas was a minor skirmish, but Roosevelt had acquitted himself well in his first taste of war. Well, he's about to get more tastes. In the following days, Colonel Wood is going to be elevated to brigade commander, and Roosevelt will be promoted to full colonel and given full command of the Rough Riders Regiment. On July 1st, 1898, which Roosevelt later called, quote, the great day of my life, American forces assaulted the heavily fortified San Juan Heights, the last line of defense protecting Santiago. The Rough Riders advanced through the jungle under Spanish artillery fire and reached the foot of a hill in front of the San Juan Heights. Confusion among the generals delayed the order to advance, but as Roosevelt recalled, quote, The instant I received the order, I sprang on my horse, and then my crowded hour began. The Rough Riders charged up the hill under heavy fire, Roosevelt rallying his men past barbed wire fences, a bullet grazing his elbow. He was the first man to reach the top of the hill where the Spanish were fleeing their position and where he promptly killed a Spaniard using a revolver that was salvaged from the wreckage of the USS Maine. Wow. At the top of the hill was a huge sugar refining kettle and the hill was christened Kettle Hill. 
It offered a commanding view of the Army's attack on San Juan Hill, 700 yards away. Roosevelt will order continuous volley fire at the Spanish position on top of San Juan Hill. Then he and his men charge off to join the Army's final push and reach the top of San Juan Hill, just in time to witness the Spanish deserting their posts. That's it. An epic engagement. And um, I will say, like, we'll talk about books and films related to TR later, but the the made-for-TV series that was later put into, like, a movie, Rough Riders with Tom Berenger as Teddy Roosevelt. Nice. It does it really well. Now, a fellow Rough Rider is going to write to Edith that, quote, Theodore was just reveling in victory and gore. In the Battle of San Juan Hill, the army accomplished what military theory deemed nearly impossible. An uphill, frontal assault against an entrenched enemy with superior firepower. The Spanish are going to suffer 114 dead and 400 wounded or captured, while the Americans suffer 144 dead and 1,100 wounded or missing. Roosevelt was proud that 89 of those casualties came from the Rough Riders, more than any other cavalry regiment. And later the same day, the Navy destroys the Spanish fleet in Santiago's harbor. The Army places Santiago under siege, and the city surrenders on July 17th, marking the end of 400 years of Spanish rule in Cuba. Wow. By the end of July, the army had spent an entire month languishing in the tropical heat, and it was beset with malaria and dysentery. A yellow fever epidemic was feared. That's it. That's, I mean, probably more scary than being killed in battle here is mm -hmm. disease. Oh, yeah. It's a classic unsung killer of... Mm -hmm. Of men in all kinds of military and engagements. And it is bad down here. Oh, yeah. And the U.S. and Spanish governments are kind of just sitting back negotiating peace terms while the armies there wilting away despite its victory. Yeah. The officers are not happy about this. So Roosevelt is going to write a letter to the Associated Press signed by all of his fellow officers urging that the army be withdrawn immediately to avert disaster. That's it. That is going to prompt the army to uh, be removed to Long Island, but the publicity of that episode rankled some of the leaders in Washington. Roosevelt would be nominated for a Medal of Honor for his actions in Cuba, but annoyed army officials are going to block the nomination from moving forward. And TR is not going to receive the Medal of Honor until he gets it posthumously in the year 2001. Yeah. Not yeah, getting that medal is going to stick in his craw. Yeah, a little bit. Because before he even returned from Cuba, Roosevelt was already being spoken of as a candidate in the upcoming New York gubernatorial election. The incumbent Republican governor was mired in a corruption scandal involving Erie Canal renovations. Though the party machine boss, Senator Thomas Platt, personally loathed Roosevelt. He knew that the popular war hero was the party's only chance for retaining the governorship. With Platt's support, T.R. easily wins the Republican nomination, and he launches an unprecedentedly aggressive campaign tour of the state, accompanied by an escort of Rough Rider veterans. His Democratic opponent, Supreme Court Justice Augustus Van Wyck, had a spotless reputation so what does Roosevelt do? Well, he touts his war record and focuses his attacks on the Tammany Hall machine boss who had publicly withdrawn support for a Democratic judicial candidate for not doing the machine's bidding. Roosevelt turns 40 just before this election, and he goes on to defeat Van Wyck by a margin of 1%. Wow. So he's going to become governor, and... During his governorship, in addition 
to his gubernatorial activities, he's also going to publish a war memoir, The Rough Riders, which will become his best-selling book. And he's also going to write and publish a biography of Oliver Cromwell. Incredible stuff here. So once again, has many irons in the fire. He sure does. Because he's certainly not going to be slouching on his gubernatorial activities. Certainly not. Taking office on January 1st, 1899, he's going to develop a pretty decent working relationship with the Thomas Platt machine. They're going to consult on making appointments acceptable to both sides. And he's even going to work together with Platt to enact an expanded state civil service reform bill that was the most comprehensive in the United States. Yeah, I mean, pretty cool, but... On the other side of the coin, Roosevelt's going to clash with the machine on the issue of corporate interests. In recent years, there had been an exponential concentration of capital in huge monopolized combinations called trusts. Roosevelt, who had decried, quote, the wealthy criminal class as a young assemblyman, was determined to do something about, quote, the combination of business with politics and the judiciary, which has done so much to enthrone privilege in the economic world. End quote. The plant machine allows a bill to impose taxes on corporations holding public franchises to pass the state senate, intending to bury it in the assembly until the legislative session expires. But... T.R., arguing that, quote, a corporation which derives its powers from the state should pay to the state a just percentage of its earnings as a return for the privileges it enjoys, uses the governor's special prerogative to force a vote on a particular bill and brings the corporate tax bill to a vote on the last day of the session. It will be passed into law because the measure is too popular for the machine to vote against it. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. I think the pre the day before that, he had sent a message over there saying, I'm using my prerogative, vote on this bill. And the guy who received the message just like put it in his pocket, like they were just going to ignore it. Yeah. And the guy who was deciding to ignore it was going to like... He's like on the verge of passing out. Wow. And then the next day, TR sent another message saying, bring this to a voter. I'm going to come down there personally yeah. and, and embarrass you. Teddy Roosevelt is never one to fuck around no. or to be fucked with. No, Thomas Platt is going to privately criticize him for being, quote, too altruistic, mm. which was a euphemism for socialistic. Yeah. And accuses him of favoring... William Jennings Bryan style populism. Mm -hmm. Roosevelt ain't gonna stand for that. No, he's gonna shoot back that the best way to stave off Bryanism and mob rule is for the Republican Party to show that it can address corporate excesses and strike a just balance between corporate and popular interests. That's it. Um, Roosevelt, I mean, he's one to rush headlong into any type of conflict because he is convinced. That he's right. Mm -hmm. And he's also going to run afoul of corporate interests when it comes to light that Louis Payne, the state superintendent of insurance, had improper secret business dealings. Powerful insurance companies wanted Payne to remain in office, but Roosevelt ordered an investigation and demanded that the Platt machine consent to Payne's replacement. The two sides come to the brink of going to war over the issue, but at the last minute, the machine caved to Roosevelt's demands. He goes on to tell a friend, quote, I have always been fond of the West African proverb, speak softly and carry a big stick. You will go far. But Platt and the corporate interests that he represented had already hatched a plan to rid themselves of their troublesome governor. They would get him nominated for vice president. Wow. Again, let's get him the fuck out of here. Yeah. Where could we put him that he can't do anything? 
No? Well, the vice presidency is pretty much useless. Let's Indeed. throw him in there. It's going to bring us to 1900. Yep, Vice President Garrett Hobart, who you will remember was number five on our list of the top five best vice presidents. He, yeah, the undersung Garrett Hobart. Yep, he died in office in November 1899. Yep, he's best remembered for what's about to happen here and not for his great tenure as vice presidency. That's right. Our listeners know all about it. Indeed. Hobart, you know, he leaves a vacancy on the ticket. For McKinley's 1900 re-election campaign. Now, Roosevelt's enemies want him out of New York, but also his best friend, Senator Henry Cabot Lodge, feels that the vice presidency is the surest path to having Roosevelt nominated for president in 1904. Now, he's not necessarily guaranteed to get a second two-year term as governor because he's clashing with the machine. And even if he does get re-elected, his term would expire in 1902, and that would give the electorate two years to forget about him prior yeah. to 1904. Now, Roosevelt himself, he recoils at the thought of the do-nothing office of vice president. He feels he could do more good remaining in the governorship, but he can't bring himself to unequivocally refuse the nomination. He keeps saying he wants to be governor, but he doesn't say that he will not accept. That's just it. And he keeps hesitating on the matter, even up and until the middle of the Republican National Convention... In June 1900, where he attends as a member of the New York delegation. That's right. Republican Party chairman, Senator Mark Hanna, despises Roosevelt, as we've said, and he feels betrayed by McKinley when the president steadfastly adheres to the position of having no preference on a running mate and leaving the decision to the convention. Hanna laments, quote, don't any of you realize that there's only one life between this madman and the presidency? But Hannah is unable to put forward any compelling alternate candidate. And the Platt Machine's efforts, they're going to pay off. And Roosevelt is going to win the nomination on the first ballot with 925 out of 926 votes. The only delegate to vote against him was himself. That's right. Yeah. Teddy Roosevelt, now vice presidential nominee, going Indeed. into the 1900 general election campaign, which is a rematch of 1896, because Democrats have once again nominated William Jennings Bryan. That's it. McKinley is once again going to stay home and conduct a front porch campaign, and he's going to leave it to his running mate to barnstorm the nation with a blistering campaign schedule. And blistering is right. Oh, yeah. Roosevelt made 673 speeches in 24 states. He traveled over 21,000 miles, addressed 3 million people. He, his campaign was even more extensive than the one William Jennings Bryan ran that year, and his campaign there in 1900 was the most extensive of any in American history, except for Bryan's 1896 campaign. That's it. And TR's efforts here are going to provide a big boost to McKinley, who's already really popular, because the economy's booming, and we've just had a successful war. The McKinley ticket is going to win a bigger victory than in 1896, prevailing in the Electoral College by a margin of 292 to 155. Between the election and the inauguration, Roosevelt goes ahead and brushes up on congressional procedure in advance of his new job of presiding over the Senate, and after his governorship expires on December 31st, 1900, he leaves on a six-week hunting trip to Colorado, where he leaps off his horse into a pack of hunting hounds and knives a cougar to death. That's right. He was the only vice president-elect to achieve that feat. Until, That's it. Until it was... Jumped off a horse and felled a cougar with a knife. What other vice president could do that? I don't think well, Kamala Harris could pull that off. Yeah, I was going to say, he was the only vice president-elect to achieve that feat until Kamala Harris duplicated it in January 2021. <laughs> And that's going to bring us to the vice presidency. Roosevelt 
is only 42 years old when he is sworn in as vice president on March 4th, 1901. He presides over the Senate for a grand total of four days before it goes out of session, as is customary, planning to come back in December. And now that he has no official duties while Congress is out of session, he takes two more trips out west during the summer. In September, he goes to Vermont for some speaking engagements while President McKinley attends the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo. That's just it. On September 6th, Roosevelt was called away from a reception to take an urgent phone call. He is informed that President McKinley has been shot in Buffalo by a young anarchist who approached him in a handshake line with a revolver concealed beneath a bandage. Roosevelt leaves immediately for Buffalo, but the following day, McKinley's condition appears to be encouraging. He continues to rally, and by September 10th, he was so improved that Roosevelt was told his presence was no longer necessary, and to reassure the American people of McKinley's recovery, he left to join his family on a vacation in the Adirondacks. Then, on September 13th, he is climbing the highest mountain in the vicinity, and he's come back to have lunch with his family when a messenger arrives with an ominous telegram. McKinley is dying. On September 14th, Roosevelt took a seven-hour carriage ride to the nearest train station. When he arrived at the station, he was handed a telegram from Secretary of State John Hay, which read, quote, The President died at 2.15 this morning. Bum, bum, bum. Teddy Roosevelt, about to become President of the United States. What is going to happen? Another bullet has felled a chief executive the third time in history. This time we have a very... Are we going to have another Andrew Johnson? Are mm -hmm. we going to have the redemption story of Chester Arthur? Or are we going to have some madman, as some people refer to him, yeah. in charge of everything? We got a very young, energetic, and unconventional vice president about to step up That's into the it. presidency. We'll find out what happens right after these words from our sponsors. Thanks for listening. The Dead Presidents Podcast is brought to you in part by Coca-Cola. When you step up to a soda fountain or into a place where bottled drinks are sold, tell the man you want Coca-Cola. Close your ears to the argument that other drinks are just as good, because there is nothing just as good as Coca-Cola. Insist on it. You have asked for Coca-Cola because it is what you want. Don't let a smooth-tongued salesman rule your judgment. Imitations are made to deceive you, not to please you. Coca-Cola not only quenches thirst and pleases the palate, but it relieves fatigue and is the only beverage that has vim and go to it. Available at all soda fountains and carbonated in bottles. Coca-Cola is just five cents everywhere. Listeners, Coca-Cola is the shit. We've been drinking it nonstop, and it doesn't just taste great. It makes us feel like we could take the world by the proverbial throat and strangle the proverbial life out of it. If I don't have a Coca-Cola for a while, I just don't feel right until I get one. And then I feel oh so right. There's just something about it. We can't put our finger on it, but we're all in. That's a message from our sponsor, Coca-Cola. This just in, we have a breaking news update. Reporters at the Los Angeles Times say that the increasing popularity of Coca-Cola is due to peculiar qualities it has which make fiends of its drinkers. 
They allege that the number of these soda fountain fiends are multiplying and that a great many people have become slaves to the Coca-Cola habit. They claim that those who understand the nature of Coca-Cola concede that it contains a small percentage of cocaine. Oh my. This allegedly accounts for the hold it has upon its drinkers. A prominent Los Angeles physician says that the Coca-Cola habit is dangerous to contract and that no one should allow himself to become a victim of it. He says that the beverage contains extracts from the coca leaf and must therefore contain cocaine. He concludes, quote, it is a dangerous drink. Listeners, we just got done telling you not to let some smooth-tongued hustler talk you out of your well-thought-out decision to drink Coca-Cola. And that's why we look on this hit piece by the so-called reporters at the Los Angeles Times with a skeptic's eye. Who's to say it's not just a hatchet job commissioned by one or more of those lame imitators that can't compete with Coca-Cola on an even playing field? And who's this so-called prominent physician bad-mouthing Coca-Cola without putting his name behind his words? He's either a quack who's justifiably afraid of being sued for defamation, or if there was no physician in the first place and the reporters just made it up. You know how they are. You know, now that I think about it, yeah, we have been drinking a ton of Coca-Cola lately, one after another, but that's our choice. We're adults. We live life on the edge. Amen. We drink a lot of Coca-Cola, but we can stop anytime we want. We just don't want to because it's awesome. This just in, we have another breaking news update. In response to criticism, Coca-Cola has changed the process by which it extracts ingredients from the cocoa leaf, and wants every doubt about the purity of its beverage removed from the minds of the public. It has commissioned six eminent chemists to analyze samples of Coca-Cola syrup with the express purpose of ascertaining whether it contains cocaine. After painstaking efforts, all six chemists, each identified by name, found no trace of cocaine. All agree that Coca-Cola is absolutely harmless. There you have it, listeners. Coca-Cola has officially caved to the crybaby mob and went and fixed something that wasn't broken. I don't know if you ever tried this new Coke yet, but you might as well not bother. You won't be missing much. I don't know what they did, but this watered-down namby-pamby concoction totally lacks the it factor that made Coca-Cola classic. Worth going back to time and again. We here at the Dead President's Podcast are straight up jonesing for some original Coca-Cola right now. But you can't get it anywhere anymore because a bunch of whiny pussies who couldn't handle a goddamn soda pop with some hair on its balls, had to go and complain to their mommies. This has not been a message from our former sponsor, Coca-Cola. Drink Moxie. And now, back oh, to the shit. show. Moxie's a product of the Coca-Cola company. <laughs> And we're back. And for the fifth time in our nation's history, a vice president has found himself thrust into the greatest seat of power. Teddy Roosevelt arrives in Buffalo on the afternoon of September 14th, and he has to borrow clothes from a friend in order to look presentable. Remember, he just come out of the mountains. Yep. He's unable to pay his respects to McKinley's corpse because an autopsy is in progress. He resists the Secret Service's efforts to accompany him with an armed guard, and as president, he is often going to carry a concealed pistol when appearing in public in order to protect himself against potential assassination attempts. This truly is the age of assassination. It's mm. going on all over the world. Mm -hmm. Anarchists are a huge fucking thing, and they're trying to kill anybody in power. Tsar Alexander II had been killed pretty recently. James Garfield is killed. 
They tried to kill Alexander the Third with a bomb under his train. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's all kinds of crap going on, and anarchists mm-hmm. is the label behind everybody. Yeah, and yeah, McKinley obviously just killed by an anarchist. Tr kind of thinking that you know he doesn't want to walk around with an armed guard. That's anathema to like the president is the man of the people you don't want to look like you're afraid of the people that's it and he also thinks that he can protect himself from assassins he jumped off of a horse and knifed a cougar to death he's a war veteran he has shot people before yeah he has uh been shot at he can handle himself and yeah. he, he thinks he can take care of himself as president well he's going to decline the cabinet's recommendation that he be sworn in right on the spot in the house where McKinley died. He opts instead to move the ceremony to a friend's private home before taking the oath of office administered by federal judge John R. Hazel. Roosevelt is going to state, quote, in this hour of deep and terrible national bereavement, I wish to state that it shall be my aim to continue absolutely unbroken the policy of president McKinley for the peace, the prosperity, and the honor of our beloved country. That's it. And at age 42, Teddy Roosevelt becomes the youngest man ever to serve as president, a record he still holds. That's right. John F. Kennedy, the youngest man elected president. Right. But T.R., only 42 when he holds the office. That's just it. And so what's the first thing you do? You hold an impromptu cabinet meeting and all the cabinet secretaries present promise to remain in their posts. However, Secretary of State John Hay and Treasury Secretary Lyman Gage were in Washington, and Roosevelt was worried by speculation that they might seek to tender their resignations. He goes on to buttonhole a journalist who was close with both secretaries, suggesting that he intended to replace them and let the journalist talk him into keeping them on the condition that the journalist would personally implore them to remain in office. This move results in both secretaries agreeing to stay on and the strong signals of continuity with the McKinley administration reassured and stabilized the financial markets. Pretty big deal. Yep. Roosevelt already displaying mastery of politics and press relations. He's going to return to Washington, D.C. on McKinley's funeral train, begin laying the foundations for his own administration. That's it. On his first day in the White House, he will meet privately in the cabinet room with the heads of the three major press agencies. And we're not talking ABC, NBC, CBS. No, but the major agencies of their day who control most of the news that comes out of Washington. Now, past presidents had been rarely available to the press. Roosevelt is now proposing to offer unprecedented access, but on his own terms. That's the gipper there. (laughs) He's emphasizing any newspaper that violates his trust, such as by misquoting him or quoting him without permission, will be cut off. The press agencies agree and Roosevelt proceeds to hold daily press briefings, and he's going to amaze reporters with his openness and candor. That's it, man. He's also going to go out of his way to treat reporters as friends and colleagues. So, as a result, he's going to receive largely favorable press coverage in an era of rapidly expanding newspaper readership, and he's going to be able to use this to shape the national political narrative and achieve massive personal popularity. It's a great boon. And he's also going to remain good to his word in ostracizing reporters whom he feels betrays him. That's right. But we got some other big issues here. So let's dive into them. Let's start with patronage. Yeah, We've talked about it mm-hmm. again and again. This and here, guy, here yeah. it pops its head again. Yeah, he's uh, not a machine politician. He's kind of an outsider to the establishment, but he's got his eye already on being nominated for a term in his own right in 1904. 
And he immediately begins making moves to position himself for that. He tells Senator Mark Hanna, who's heartbroken over the death of his personal friend, McKinley. That's it. Tells Hanna that he wants his friendship. And Hanna says, you know, I hope I can be of service. But he warns Roosevelt to not, don't start thinking about 1904. And privately, Hanna says, quote, now look, that damned cowboy is president of the United States. Yeah. He's mad. Nobody listened to him about the vice presidential nomination. That's it. And now they've got this renegade who isn't going to play ball. And Mark Hanna, pretty powerful Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, you know, and he finds himself uh, in an uncomfortable situation for him. Now... He holds particular sway over Southern delegates to the Republican National Convention. And Roosevelt looks to cut into that influence. Yeah, so, that's where a lot of the African-American Republicans hold their most power at the Republican Convention. That's just it. Because de- those Southern states, they're not ever going to vote for a Republican in the in the general election. But no. they tip the balance at the convention. They sure do. So in one of his first acts as president, T.R. asks Booker T. Washington, the nation's most prominent black leader, to come to the Capitol to consult on patronage. He and Washington both agree that it's counterproductive to appoint large numbers of African Americans to federal posts in the South where their presence stokes the hatred of blatantly racist whites. Instead, Roosevelt would appoint mostly Southern whites with more enlightened racial attitudes. He takes Washington's recommendation by naming as a federal judge former Alabama governor Thomas Jones, a Democrat. Roosevelt also agrees to appoint African Americans to federal posts in northern states, which no previous president had done before. Then, he's going to seal the deal with another presidential first. On October 16, 1901, he invites Booker T. Washington to dinner at the White House, an honor never before bestowed on an African American. Yeah, like, political meeting is one thing, but dinner is like a social event. That's it. This is accepting him as a social equal And that's going to spark major outrage in the South. Yes, it is. Georgia's governor said, quote, no Southerner can respect any white man who would eat with a Negro. What a dick. South Carolina Senator Benjamin Tillman said, quote, now that Roosevelt has eaten with that N-word Washington, we shall have to kill a thousand N-words to get them back in their places. What an insufferable ass. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, fuck those people. But... There it is. That's history. Yeah, TR, you know, he was kind of taken aback by how much outrage this caused, and he was defiant, like, I'll I'll eat with Booker T. Washington anytime I want. But then he and Washington kind of agreed that it would be best that not yeah, to doing make stuff a like display. that, you know, yeah. making a display about it was counterproductive. So he, they did more of their work behind the scenes. Yeah. That's just it. And when Congress comes back into session in December 1901, Roosevelt is going to take further steps to wrest party control from Hanna. He replaces Lyman Gage as Treasury Secretary with Iowa Governor Leslie Shaw, and he also names Henry Payne as Postmaster General. These men were allies of William Allison and John Spooner, two of the most powerful Republican senators. Roosevelt also gained the support of other prominent Hanna rivals, including Ohio Senator Joseph Forker and Pennsylvania Senator Matthew Quay. Hanna, whose health was beginning to decline at this point, was increasingly marginalized by Roosevelt's deft use of federal patronage. That's right. The president has a lot of power. You think this guy Roosevelt, we heard how many waves he was making in the virtually powerless offices of Civil Service Commissioner, Police Commissioner, Assistant Navy Secretary. Now he's president. Yeah. You better watch out. That's just it. Let's get into the trust busting. That's right. It's just as good as dose busting. 
Mm-hmm. Teddy Roosevelt was apt to say, Bustin' makes me feel good. That's right. Now he starts off, you know, he's making friends with prominent senators and he tries to appease some pro-business congressmen by cutting aggressive proposals to regulate trusts out of his first State of the Union message in December 1901. But he's going to continue working behind the scenes with Attorney General Philander Knox to look for an opportunity to address the trust issue. In November 1901, J.P. Morgan, James J. Hill, and E.H. Harriman had orchestrated the formation of a gargantuan new railroad trust, the Northern Securities Company, a combination of the Great Northern and Northern Pacific Railroads that threatened to monopolize railroad traffic in the western United States and would be the world's largest company. That's just it. We're talking mammoth. Mm Mm-hmm. Back in 1895, the Supreme Court had narrowly interpreted the Sherman Antitrust Act, which banned monopolies and, quote, combinations in restraint of trade or commerce, ruling that the government had limited power to regulate trusts. However, Attorney General Knox now believed that he could get that interpretation overturned with a suit against the Northern Securities Company, and Roosevelt ordered him to proceed. That's it. And in February of 1902, Wall Street is shocked when Knox announces the lawsuit. J.P. Morgan shows up at the White House and offers to fix whatever's wrong with the trust. And he is told, quote, we don't want to fix it up. We want to stop it. Yep, we're making an example of you here. That's it. Knox also files suit against the so-called Beef Trust for anti-competitive price fixing in the meatpacking industry. In 1903, Roosevelt successfully marshaled popular opinion to pressure Congress into passing a series of bills to rein in corporate abuses. One bill established and funded an antitrust division in the Justice Department to better enable the Attorney General to prosecute rogue corporations. The Elkins Act banned the railroad rebates by which railroads offer discounted shipping rates to preferred major customers, which give corporations an unfair advantage over the smaller competitors. Another bill created a new cabinet department, the Department of Commerce and Labor, which included a Bureau of Corporations that would closely monitor industrial activities. Uh, we were talking about the meatpacking industry. Remember, this is around the time that Upton Sinclair's The Jungle came out. Mm-hmm. And people were made aware of how disgusting some of these big plants were. Yeah. Well, that's coming up soon. Indeed. As the first uh, Secretary of Commerce and Labor, Roosevelt will name George B. Cordelieu the loyal personal secretary that he had inherited from President McKinley. And then after these legislative victories, newspapers hailed Roosevelt as, quote, the original trust buster. Yeah. And then judicial victories would follow in subsequent years as those lawsuits made their way through the courts. In March 1904, the Roosevelt administration won the Northern Securities Antitrust suit with the Supreme Court ruling that the trust violated the Sherman Act and had to be dissolved. Roosevelt, Big Vic. That's right. Roosevelt was disappointed with the dissenting opinion issued by Oliver Wendell Holmes, whom he had appointed to the court in 1902, who was number five on our list of the top five greatest Supreme Court justices. Indeed. And then in 1905, the Supreme Court also struck down the Beef Trust. That's it. So these are the first, like, real big victories against trusts, which had been becoming a major issue for the past decade or more. McKinley was kind of talking about doing something about it prior to his death. Roosevelt coming in and really doing something about it. Yeah, and this is no small feat. I mean, he's really going against the power of He's taking on the richest and most powerful men in the world. And 
also, you know, during a booming economy. Right. That is booming in large part because of a lot of these corporations. That's just it. But as Roosevelt had said when he was governor, you need to strike a balance between corporate and popular interests or you're going to be in trouble. Indeed. Well, that's going to bring us to the Panama Canal. As we've talked about, many presidents have dreamed of building a Central American canal connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. It goes back to Zachary Taylor and Millard Fillmore. That's right. That's when Taylor entered into the 1850 clayton Bulwer Treaty, by which the U.S. and Britain had agreed to joint control of any potential canal. But in the final months of McKinley's life, Secretary of State John Hay successfully renegotiated that treaty in the new hay Ponsafote Treaty, if that's how you pronounce it, Britain acquiesced to U.S. control over a canal, provided that all nations be granted access during peacetime. The Senate ratified the treaty in the first months of Roosevelt's administration, and he launched efforts to make the long-dreamed-of canal a reality. That's just it. A presidential commission appointed by McKinley recommended Nicaragua as the most feasible route for a canal, though it was noted that Panama would allow for a shorter canal with less maintenance. However, Panama was a province of Colombia, which was divided by civil war. Also, Colombia had sold the rights to build a canal to a French company, which, though its own construction efforts had failed, now demanded $109 million from the U.S. to acquire its rights. So we got impediments here. Despite these, Roosevelt prefers the Panama route. With most members of Congress favoring Nicaragua, the French company saw its only potential buyer for its Panama rights slipping away and lowered its asking price to $40 million, which would make the Panama option slightly cheaper than Nicaragua. Well, Roosevelt is going to order the Presidential Commission to reconsider its findings immediately, and a new recommendation was issued for Panama. Several powerful senators, including Mark Hanna, began to advocate for Panama, and the French company's representative, Philippe Bunovaria, lobbied Congress extensively. In June 1903, volcanic activity in Nicaragua was the last straw, and Congress passed the Spooner Act, which authorized Roosevelt to spend $40 million to acquire the Panama Canal rights and $130 million to build a canal. That's just it. Hay negotiates a treaty with Colombia for a 100-year lease of the canal route in exchange for $10 million dollars and $250,000 in annual payments. The U.S. Senate ratified the treaty, but the Colombian Senate did not. The notoriously corrupt Colombian Senate demanded a much greater sum of money and suggested that the U.S. cut the French company out of the deal and give its $40 million to Colombia. At Roosevelt's urging, Hay issued a stark message that the U.S. would not renegotiate and that if Colombia rejected the treaty, it would compromise its friendship with the U.S. Despite these warnings, on August 12, 1903, Colombia rejected the treaty. Oh, now it's on. Indeed. Roosevelt turned his eyes to an old 1846 treaty, which President James K. Polk had negotiated with Colombia, That treaty granted the U.S. free transit rights across Colombia, and Roosevelt believed Colombia was now violating this treaty by denying the canal rights. That's just it. This 1846 treaty required the U.S. to protect Colombian territorial integrity, and U.S. military and naval power had indeed protected the Colombian government against external and internal threats many times over the years. But no longer... That's right. Upon Colombia's rejection of the treaty, a new revolt rose up in Panama. Now, you can probably, you know know where Panama is. 
-hmm. It's the littlest point right there at the tip of South America. That's where Colombia is. It's really divided by mountains from Panama. Right. It's really not – Panama is not naturally part of Colombia. It, it's just kind of claimed by Colombia at this time. It doesn't want to be part of it, especially now that Colombia is compromising this canal. Indeed. Roosevelt has intelligence that an independent Panama would grant canal rights on favorable terms. That's right. So this is going to lead him to send U.S. Navy ships to Panama – and he orders them to occupy the U.S. constructed railroad and prevent the passage of any armed forces, including both rebels and Colombian government troops. This action prevents Colombia from sending reinforcements to Panama and enables the rebels to take control. Now, in early November 1903, the Republic of Panama declares independence from Colombia, and Roosevelt promptly recognizes its sovereignty. While anti-imperialists in America were outraged, public opinion overwhelmingly favors Roosevelt's actions. He argued that a project so beneficial to the world at large could not be held hostage by one small-minded corrupt government. That's right. Panama is going to appoint as its minister to the United States, Philippe Bonuvaria, the French company representative, yeah. he had provided financial aid to the revolutionaries, was one of the guys scheming to make this revolution happen. Right. Hay and Bonuvaria are going to swiftly negotiate a new treaty granting the U.S. perpetual sovereignty over the canal zone in exchange for $10 million and steadily increasing annual payments. The treaty is ratified by the U.S. Senate and the new government of Panama. The U.S. will establish the Isthmian Canal Commission to oversee the canal zone, and construction soon began. In 1906, Roosevelt will become the first sitting president to travel outside the United States when he visited the canal zone to inspect the progress. That's it, man. First sitting president to leave the U.S., and the completed Panama Canal is finally going to open in 1914. Roosevelt considers it not only one of the greatest achievements of his presidency, but an apocal accomplishment in human history. Yep, this is big. He's uniting the Western and Eastern Hemispheres, the Atlantic and Pacific, and it's also a big boon to U.S. naval power. Indeed. And, a, and its ability to transfer its ships from one ocean to another. But hey, what about all that Spanish-American war stuff? Well, speaking of... That went down naval when McKinley power. was president. Now TR's in there. What's going to happen with that? Well, it's still happening. The United States, of course, annexed the former Spanish colony of the Philippines after that war, and when that happened, native Filipinos who wanted independence felt betrayed, and they launched an insurgency against U.S. authority. The McKinley administration believed the Philippines was not ready for self-government and worried that Germany or Japan might gain control of an independent Philippines. That's right. McKinley named federal judge William Howard Taft as civil governor and by the time Roosevelt ascended to the presidency, the rebellion was on its last legs. In the spring of 1902, with Congress contemplating a bill to solidify the civil government and the Democratic opposition favoring Philippine independence, controversy breaks out over American conduct against the insurgency. That's right. After Roosevelt declared that the U.S. Army had conducted itself, quote, with self-restraint and with humanity never surpassed if ever equaled in any conflict, contrary facts came to light. Yeah. An Army report alleged that one Filipino province had been brutalized by American soldiers who routinely called natives by the N-word. Mm. Testimony before a congressional committee disclosed that Americans were employing water torture later known more euphemistically as waterboarding, yeah. 
and also that one American general had ordered his men to, quote, kill and burn all natives over the age of 10. Yeah. When a court-martial provided a lenient sentence for that general, Roosevelt overrode the decision and dismissed him from the army. He said, quote, I thoroughly believe in severe measures when necessary, and am not in the least sensitive about killing any number of men when there is adequate reason. But he had no tolerance for wanton cruelty or violence against women and children. That's right. He ordered the general in overall command of the Philippines to take measures to prevent any cruelty or brutality and to punish any guilty men and noted that even cruelty committed against American troops did not justify responding in kind. In July 1902, the insurgency was deemed over. The office of military governor was retired. Roosevelt declared an amnesty for any Filipinos who participated in the rebellion, and a new civil government bill was passed that extended the guarantees of the Constitution's Bill of Rights to the Philippines. Roosevelt went on to say, quote, We believe that we can rapidly teach the people of the Philippine Islands how to make good on their freedom, but added, quote, When that time will come, it is not in human wisdom to foretell. That's right. The American administration established major infrastructure and educational improvements in the Philippines, but outbreaks of violence continued as the island's small Muslim population resisted American authority. By the end of his presidency, Roosevelt confided to Taft that he considered the Philippines, quote, our heel of Achilles and wished that it could be granted independence with some international guarantee for the preservation of order. But the status quo would endure for decades to come. In 1934, Congress agreed to grant Philippine independence in 10 years, but World War II intervened and Japan occupied the Philippines. From 1941 to 45, in 46, the U.S. finally recognized Philippine independence. Took a long while. Mm -hmm. And let's turn our attention from the Philippines to Cuba. Cuba, unlike the Philippines, had not yet been annexed, of course, despite efforts of previous presidents to acquire it, as we've mentioned before with Polk and Pierce, amongst some that have wanted Cuba. But it has not been annexed. But rather than receive an American pledge to support its independence and a disavowal of any desire to acquire its territory, U.S. troops still occupy Cuba Following the Spanish-American War and during the McKinley administration, Cuba agrees to the terms of the Platt Amendment, which gives the U.S. the right to intervene militarily to uphold Cuba's independence and to maintain naval bases in Cuba. As President uh, Roosevelt now maintains support for Cuban independence, and in 1902, he is going to withdraw all remaining U.S. troops from the island. He also lobbies Congress for a trade reciprocity agreement lowering tariffs in Cuba, which was granted in 1902 despite strong opposition from the domestic sugar industry. In 1903, the U.S. and Cuba enter into a treaty reaffirming the tenets of the Platt Amendment, which Cuba had also written into its own constitution, and they agreed to a permanent lease for the U.S. naval base at Guantanamo Bay. Wow. Waterboarding, Guantanamo Bay. Terms that would not become prominent again for almost exactly 100 years later. That's right. Well, TR making good on the liberation of Cuba that he personally participated in. Indeed. Well, what else has he got going on? In August 1902, he embarks on a campaign tour to support Republicans in the upcoming midterm elections, when in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, on September 3rd, he was riding in a carriage that was struck by a trolley car, and he was thrown from the carriage and landed on his face. Yeah, this was 
pretty intense, actually. Yeah, the carriage driver was crushed by the trolley and killed. A fate that very nearly befell Roosevelt himself, escaping by perhaps inches. And with the vice presidency vacant, the presidency would have devolved on Secretary of State John Hay under the line of succession then in place by established by the Presidential Succession Act of 1886. That's it. Interesting Roosevelt fact. is going to suffer a seriously bruised face and left shin. He continued his tour, but his shin only gets worse. And in late September, he actually undergoes surgery to drain pus from a two-inch tumor on his shin. So, obviously it got infected. But T.R., being the fucking badass that he is, refuses anesthetic, saying, quote, Guess I can stand the pain. He'll end up confined to a wheelchair for several weeks and is unable to mount a horse for six months. Well, being in a wheelchair, not necessarily going to slow him down. No, the grit of Teddy Roosevelt. Yep. Because issues are still coming at him. In the summer of 1902, the United Mine Workers of America launched a major strike, striking for better pay and improved working conditions. The coal trusts refused to recognize the union and also refused to negotiate. Violence between strikers and strike breakers resulted in more than a few deaths. Attorney General Knox advised Roosevelt that he had no legal authority to intervene. But with winter approaching and millions of Americans in danger of not having enough coal to heat their homes, he felt he had to do something. That's it. He's not going to let the American people suffer. Nope. Winter is coming. In October, he invited the union leaders and mine owners to a meeting at the White House. They accepted, and this would be the first time that the mine owners agreed to attend a meeting with the union. Yeah. From his wheelchair, Roosevelt declared that he represented the interests of neither side but of the general public and urged that mining operations resume immediately. Union leaders offered to resume work if Roosevelt would appoint an arbitration commission to resolve the dispute, and they agreed to accept whatever decision such a commission would make. Mine owners, on the other hand, initially rejected that offer, but after War Secretary Elihu Root encouraged J.P. Morgan to get involved, Morgan secured the mine owner's agreement upon receiving certain assurances as to the composition of the Arbitration Commission and the permission for the mine owners to continue to deny that they were negotiating with the union. That's it. And after Roosevelt appoints the commissioners, the strike ends in late October, giving him a major boost in popularity just before the midterm elections. It's a good look. Democrats are going to make slight gains in the House and Senate, but Republicans are going to retain strong majorities in both chambers. Yeah, the, usually midterm elections, the incumbent party gets... Hosed. That's just it. Not they, in this case, though. They did pretty good. They they did. And the Arbitration Commission is going to go ahead and investigate the coal fields, and they take testimony from over 500 witnesses before issuing a decision that split the difference between the miners' and owners' positions, providing for a 10% wage increase, reducing the workday, from 10 to 9 hours, and instituting a permanent arbitration board made up equally of miners and owners' representatives to resolve future disputes. A pretty decent compromise. Yeah. This Teddy Roosevelt guy really knows how to wield power. Indeed. Getting some things done. This damned cowboy turning out to be a pretty popular president. Mm -hmm. He's capturing the imagination of the nation. He's very popular not only because of his political successes, but also his big personality, his iconic personal image. That's it. He's a hell of a man. Mm -hmm. Everybody that ever met him, 
He stuck with them forever. Mm -hmm. Boisterous. Charming. A little eccentric. Mm -hmm. But wild and quirky. I mean... Yeah, one one incident that's going to play on his image here in November 1902. He's on a pretty unsuccessful hunting trip. He's disappointed with the progress of the hunting. His guides lassoed a small injured black bear, and they held it until he would arrive to get the kill. Like, okay, let's hold this and let the president shoot it. Yeah. He gets there, and he looks at it, and he's very dismayed at the sorry state of this bear. He refuses to shoot it. He tells his companions to put it out of its misery, and he ends up being praised for his sportsmanlike conduct, and his refusal to shoot the bear quickly became a popular image for political cartoons. Despite the fact that the bear was knifed to death. Well, yeah. They put it out of its misery, sure. Mm. But he wasn't going to shoot it. From the blood of the bear sprung... The image of the teddy bear. Yeah, there was a new line of bear cub stuffed animals coming out that winter, and somehow it picked up the nickname, and the teddy bear was born. That's just it. Not dissimilar to how George Washington started the story of the Tooth Fairy. Pretty similar. Yes, and... That's going to bring us to Venezuela. In December 1902, Roosevelt secretly and unilaterally brought the nation to the brink of war with Germany, the world's most formidable military power, in a diplomatic crisis that remained virtually unknown for decades because both countries covered it up. Now, this is some crazy shit, James. Mm -hmm. That's right. The flashpoint was Venezuela, where a new regime had stopped payment on the country's massive foreign debt, which was held mostly by British and German creditors. When Venezuela refused to negotiate, the British and German navies established a blockade. Now, Roosevelt believed that European nations had a right to pursue their claims against Latin American nations, but that any seizure of territory would violate the Monroe Doctrine. Mm Mm-hmm. That old Monroe Doctrine. Yep. Britain was willing to arbitrate the dispute, but when Germany proposed to temporarily seize a Venezuelan port as a guarantee of payment, Roosevelt recalled how Germany's temporary occupation of a Chinese port in 1898 had turned into a 99-year lease. Yeah. He's not about to see that happening. Not in our hemisphere. No, certainly not. He informs the German ambassador that if Germany seized any territory, he would be, quote, obliged to interfere by force if necessary. He had coincidentally sent Admiral Dewey to the Caribbean to conduct training exercises with an unprecedentedly large fleet of U.S. warships. Though the German Navy was significantly larger as a whole... Dewey would vastly outnumber the Germans in the potential theater of action. The German ambassador did not initially convey Roosevelt's threat to the Kaiser until another German diplomat, who knew Roosevelt well, assured him that the president was, quote, not bluffing. Yeah, you better take this guy seriously. That's it. When the threat was conveyed, the Reichstag voted secretly to accept arbitration. The secret, unofficial nature of the threat allowed Germany to back down without losing face. And that's something that they're going to hold close to in the very near future. That's true. Yeah, the Kaiser is going to keep crossing paths with Roosevelt's life, and he's going to be very interested in how the Kaiser sees himself. That's it. Well, uh, Roosevelt is going to decline Britain and Germany's request that he arbitrate the dispute, and instead he allowed the U.S. ambassador to Venezuela to actually represent Venezuela at the arbitration. Mm -hmm. By doing so, you know, that sounds like it might be a very pro-Venezuela move, but... Maybe not not so much. 
Yeah, because by doing that, he is going to force Venezuela to accept fair repayment terms. Right. And he declares that if Venezuela does not abide by the agreement, he would enforce it himself using U.S. military power if necessary. Yeah. As much as he was determined to uphold the Monroe Doctrine against European powers, he was equally determined not to let Latin American countries, quote, hide behind the doctrine in order to shirk their obligations. Yeah. So he's got a pretty serious interpretation of it, and he's enforcing it. Yeah. And a very similar situation is going to play out in 1904. Right. In the Dominican Republic, where once again the country is defaulting on foreign debt. Germany, very angry and demanding repayment. Once again, Admiral Dewey holding his fleet in readiness nearby. Yeah. This time the Kaiser sends Roosevelt a letter flattering him, praising him for, quote, his unlimited power for work, dauntless energy of purpose, iron will, and pureness of motives moving toward the highest ideals. Yeah. Kaiser's trying to butter him up. Uh Uh-huh. Germany requests that the U.S. place the Dominican Republic under American receivership, while the Dominican government requests annexation by the United States. That's it. And Roosevelt really has no desire for annexation. So he negotiates an agreement whereby the U.S. is going to take control of the Dominican Customs House and ensure that its customs revenues are used to make their debt payments. He's really not playing around here. No. He's taken on a pretty new and interesting interpretation of the Monroe Doctrine, one that is going to bear his own name. That's it. And uh, he really appears to be fully wielding Mm -hmm. the powers of the presidency and kind of creating an image for the presidency that we've not seen probably since Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And even with Lincoln, that was mostly in hindsight. Right. And even on kind of an international plane that we've really never seen before, Mm -hmm. because we talked about, you know, in the McKinley administration is when the U.S. kind of stepped up and became an imperial power. Yeah. The Roosevelt administration is when they really start to see that, like, in action. Yeah. And that's when he develops his new doctrine, because he's seeing that the Monroe Doctrine has two sides. It's not just about keeping European powers out. If you're going to do that... You have to manage the hemisphere on your own. Yeah, that's just it. So in his December 1904 State of the Union address, he formally announced the policy that he'd been developing during these crises in Panama, Venezuela, and the Dominican Republic, a policy that became known as the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine. That's it. He said, quote, All that this country desires is to see the neighboring countries stable, orderly and prosperous. Any country whose people conduct themselves well can count upon our hearty friendship. If a nation shows that it knows how to act with reasonable efficiency and decency in social and political matters, if it keeps order and pays its obligation, it need fear no interference from the United States. Chronic wrongdoing or an impotence which results in a general loosening of ties of civilized society may, in America as elsewhere, ultimately require intervention by some civilized nation, and in the Western Hemisphere, the adherence of the United States to the Monroe Doctrine may force the United States, however reluctantly, in flagrant cases of such wrongdoing or impotence, to the exercise of an international police power. That's it. This is speaking softly and carrying a big stick. This is the comics of the era of Roosevelt as a tiny man with a giant club facing against the giant bankers and capitalists Mm -hmm. and all his foes. Mm -hmm. This is Team America, Western Hemisphere Police. Right. It really is. Now, in April 1903, Roosevelt is going to embark on an eight-week Western tour that is going to take him 14,000 miles through 25 states and during which he is going to deliver approximately 200 speeches, including several major policy addresses, in Chicago, 
He used his speak softly and carry a big stick adage for the first time as president, applying it to the Monroe Doctrine and a well-prepared Navy. The memorable phrase made headlines and thereafter supporters would brandish sticks to display their enthusiasm, as well as beat the shit out of his opponents, <laughs> presumably. He also, at this uh, time, began using another memorable phrase, quote, a square deal, which is going to grow into a slogan representing the ideal behind his whole domestic policy. He's going to revisit his old stomping grounds in the Badlands, recalling, quote, It was still the Wild West in those days. We saw men die violent deaths as they worked among the horses and cattle or fought in evil feuds with one another. But we felt the beat of hardy life in our veins, and ours was the glory of work and the joy of living. Yep, continuing his Western tour, Roosevelt took a private two-week sojourn in Yellowstone National Park, where he marveled at, quote, the majesty and beauty of the wilderness and of wildlife. And he also upheld his vow to shoot no game while in the park. He also visited the Grand Canyon, describing it as, quote, beautiful and terrible and unearthly. And the conservationist in him declared, quote, Leave it as it is. You cannot improve on it. The ages have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. Keep it for your children, your children's children, and for all who come after you. Yeah, I think some of this is Teddy Roosevelt's greatest legacy. Mm -hmm. In California, he's going to visit Yosemite National Park, and soon orders an expansion of the park's lands using his powers under the Forest Reserve Act. He creates almost 40 new forest reserves in his first term and secures the passage of a bill that transfers the Bureau of Forestry from the Interior Department to the Agriculture Department, where it was renamed the U.S. Forest Service and became more focused on conservationist efforts under the leadership of Gifford Pinchot, a conservation activist and Roosevelt's close advisor. Roosevelt also is going to lobby hard for the National Reclamation Act, which passed in 1902 and which funded dams and irrigation projects in arid western states, placing 230 million acres under federal protection. This is also a time where you can find stories of the outcry against ladies' hats. People poaching birds for feathers for women's hats. And mm -hmm. Roosevelt put an end to that mm -hmm. and started declaring different mm -hmm. places uh, no-kill zones mm -hmm. to save these bird populations that were getting massacred mm -hmm. for women's fancy hats. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, he's all for hunting, but not destroying the population. Yeah. And that brings us to the uh, issue of race relations. Yeah. A very thorny issue for many presidents. Indeed. Roosevelt, of course, was half Southern by virtue of his entirely unreconstructed mother. Mm -hmm. But he pretty quickly earned the ire of Southern Democrats when he invited Booker T. Washington to dine at the White House. And then also during the uh, Philippines insurgency controversy, he said that the alleged army atrocities paled in comparison to lynchings that occurred in the U.S. with regularity. Well, wow. Another comment that caused outrage in the South. And then... In June 1903, a particularly brutal lynching occurred in Delaware when a black man who'd confessed to killing a white woman was dragged out of jail by a mob and burned alive. Wow. After a similar lynch mob menaced an Indiana jail the next month, Roosevelt took the opportunity to issue a public letter to Indiana's governor in which he condemned lynching stating that, quote, all thoughtful men must feel the gravest alarm over the growth of lynching in this country, and especially 
over the peculiarly hideous forms so often taken by mob violence when colored men are the victims, on which occasions the mob seems to lay most weight not on the crime but on the color of the criminal. Yeah. He argued that a participant in a lynching degraded himself and that he, quote, must forever after have the awful spectacle of his own handiwork seared into his brain and soul. He can never again be the same man. In 1903, several black federal appointees brought their wives to a White House reception the first time black women had been entertained at a private White House function, but whose presence is going to prompt Southern congressmen to storm out swearing never to visit the White House again. While these scummy white racists called Roosevelt an N-word-loving president, African Americans called him our president and compared him to Lincoln. In 1903, he nominated a black man, William Crumb, for the Collector of Customs of the Port of Charleston, Outraged South Carolina Senator Benjamin Tillman said, quote, We still have guns and ropes in the South, and filibustered the confirmation vote until the congressional session expired when Roosevelt simply put Crumb in office as a recess appointment. When the long serving postmaster of Indianola, Mississippi, a black woman named Minnie Cox, offered her resignation after coercion by local whites, Roosevelt refused to accept the resignation. He continued to pay Mrs. Cox her full salary, but closed the Indianola post office and forced the local whites to travel 30 miles to the neighboring town to pick up their racist hate mail. There you have it. And there you have it. I mean, I I think that some people have tried to argue against TR in terms of like the backlash over the Booker T Washington dinner mm-hmm. because he never like invited him back mm-hmm. and WB Du Bois mm-hmm. the author said something like kind of anti Roosevelt about that whole thing but the thing to remember is Roosevelt and Booker T Washington reached that understanding together mm-hmm. and they agreed that it was best not to do that. Yeah. You know, so I I wouldn't rip Roosevelt for, like, turning his back on people of color. No. Because he he, he really didn't. I mean, he tried to do uh, as much as he could kind of behind the scenes or in his own way. And we're going to get to an issue later in his presidency that was not good for African Americans. But yeah. He did some good work for them as well. And then also for Jewish Americans. Yeah. Because uh, in uh, April 1903, um, an anti-Semitic riot in Kishinev, Russia, left hundreds of Jews dead or injured, um, which was a growing problem in Russia. Yeah. Outraged Americans held rallies in major cities, and Roosevelt was approached by Jewish American leaders who wanted him to make an official protest and call upon the Tsar to stop Russia's increasing persecution of Jews. At the time, however, Roosevelt was striving to remain neutral in Russia's ongoing war with Japan, and he was reluctant to officially denounce the Tsar's actions. That's it. But he's determined to do something nevertheless. So he has Secretary of State Hay send an official diplomatic cable to his Russian counterpart asking whether the Tsar would accept an unofficial protest petition drafted by American Jews. The official cable quoted the full text of the unofficial petition. As expected, Russia refused to accept the petition, but the maneuver got the petition into the newspapers and around the world while enabling the U.S. to remain diplomatically neutral as to its contacts. American Jews are going to go on to applaud Roosevelt's efforts and overwhelmingly support his 1904 re-election campaign. During his second term, Roosevelt is going to make history by appointing the first Jewish cabinet secretary when he named Oscar Strauss 
as Secretary of Commerce. Nice. Man, he is doing a lot of stuff. Indeed. In 19... Here, this is an interesting one as well. In 1903, William Miller was fired from his job as a foreman in the government printing office when he ran afoul of the union that represented all of the office's employees. And against the vociferous protest of labor union leaders, Roosevelt reinstated Miller to his post and declared that civil service rules mandated an open shop policy for government jobs, meaning that employees could not be forced to join unions or be punished for not doing so. And the nation's labor leaders, top union leaders, come to the White House and threaten to withdraw support for his re-election campaign. He doubles down on his decision, telling them that he was, quote, sworn to administer laws that were enacted for the benefit of the whole people. I can no more recognize the fact that a man does or does not belong to a union as being for or against him than I can recognize the fact that he is a Protestant or a Catholic, a Jew or a Gentile as being for or against him. Yeah. He then leaked this statement to the press and won popular approval for his position. The leaders of the American Federation of Labor backed down on their threats to oppose his reelection. Yeah. Seemingly a very uh, strong and uh, forceful president here thus far. Mm -hmm. Seems to be doing a pretty bang up job. Yeah, I mean, for somebody that was considered a damned cowboy and a maniac. Yeah, he's not afraid to take on, you know, J.P. Morgan and the big trust leaders. He's also going to take on the big labor leaders. That's it. He's not backing down. From anything. In 1904, a Moroccan rebel leader kidnapped a prominent American citizen and held him hostage, making demands against the Moroccan government. Roosevelt sent the U.S. Navy's Mediterranean squadron to Tangier and demanded that the Moroccan government get the American back alive or, if he died, to make his kidnappers pay with their lives. The U.S. demand prompted the Moroccan government to pay the hefty ransom required to effectuate the Americans' release. Nice. Not to be trifled with. Mm -hmm. There we go again. Yeah, there was a, an ironic twist to this. While this was going on, they found out that this American may not technically be an American citizen, that he actually gave up his American citizenship during the Civil War and assumed Greek citizenship to avoid paying taxes. Wow. But Roosevelt felt the reason he was kidnapped was because they thought he was American, and it was mm. like an attack on American interests, so it didn't matter whether he it really was, the was or not. It was the symbology of it, yeah. yeah. Well, mm. also in 1904, in a similar incident of gunboat diplomacy, the U.S. ambassador to Turkey complained that the Ottoman Empire had long violated treaty obligations by discriminating against American missionaries and schools by refusing the ambassador diplomatic access. Roosevelt advised the ambassador to repeat his demands to the Sultan when a U.S. Navy squadron appeared off the coast of Turkey. The Sultan quickly promised to rectify his errors and Roosevelt ordered the Navy to move on. Mm -hmm. So, a you little show of badassery. Yeah. You want to ignore the ambassador? Fine. You want to ignore him when a Navy squadron is standing behind him? Yeah, have fun ignoring yeah. him yeah. now. Try. And, you know, hey, it's 1904. We got some shit going on. This is a big year. Yeah. You know, when he when Roosevelt first came into the presidency, the Republican Party establishment you know, viewed him with skepticism and fear. Uh, yeah, as we said, he's a madman. He's some cowboy. Yeah, party chairman Mark Hanna was hoping that someone else would be the party's nominee in 1904. But by the time that election rolls around, Roosevelt's stunning success, his massive popularity, and his adroit political moves had secured him total control of the party. That's just it. Big business leaders, upset by his trust-busting policies, had initially hoped to nominate, quote, someone like Hannah in 1904, but Hannah's Ohio rival Senator Joseph Foraker outmaneuvered him at the 1903 Ohio Party Convention and forced Hannah 
to back an early endorsement of Roosevelt for re-election. Hanna is in failing health at this point, and he dies in February 1904. When the Republican National Convention is held in June, Roosevelt has no rivals and is unanimously renominated on the first ballot. The vice presidential nomination will go to Indiana Senator Charles Fairbanks, a favorite of big business conservatives. Now, Roosevelt had once called Fairbanks, quote, a reactionary machine politician, and he would go on to give him no significant role as vice president. That's right. Who are they going to be up against? Well, in July, the Democratic National Convention nominated Alton B. Parker, chief judge of the New York Court of Appeals. He was very well-respected, and because he had not been active as a politician for many years, he had taken no controversial positions and made no enemies. Yeah. And in the general election campaign, they don't really oppose each other on too many issues, so it becomes something of a popularity contest, which mm -hmm. Alton B. Parker cannot hold a candle to Teddy Roosevelt. No. Parker came from the more conservative wing of the Democratic Party. He was endorsed by Grover Cleveland, although he was denounced by William Jennings Bryan as, quote, a tool of Wall Street. And that doesn't help when someone in your own party is, you know... Well, the Democratic Party is two-faced at this time. Indeed. Newspaper magnate William Randolph Hearst had been the favorite of that radical populist bimetallist wing of the Democratic Party, but Parker's supporters were sufficient to win him the nomination on the first ballot. Former West Virginia Senator Henry Davis was his running mate. Roosevelt uh, ruffled some feathers when he named George Cordelieu as party chairman and campaign manager, a choice very controversial among experienced party operatives. Cordelieu does not have... Any of the kind of background that party chairman usually has. Yeah, he was the uh, just a trusted aide of McKinley. Yeah, but by this point, he is Secretary of Commerce and Labor. He is charged with monitoring corporate activities and therefore has an intimate knowledge of potential campaign contributors. Yeah. He is able to raise huge amounts of money from big business leaders who, by this point, are kind of backed into the corner and line up to support Roosevelt. It's pretty obvious he's going to win. Yeah. You want to be on his good side. Well, that's it. E.H. Harriman, one of the masterminds behind the Northern Securities Trust that Roosevelt had dismantled, loyally acceded to Roosevelt's request to provide last-minute campaign funds to aid Republican candidates in New York state elections. Democrats are disappointed by Parker's lack of charisma and his reluctance to go on the attack against Roosevelt. But in the last days of the campaign, Parker suggested that the trusts were buying the election for Roosevelt. Uh, Roosevelt, who had reluctantly followed the tradition of sitting presidents not personally campaigning, took offense at this charge and broke his silence to denounce it as, quote, a wicked falsehood. He also pointed out, that the Democratic campaign was similarly bankrolled by corporate interests, including Standard Oil and J.P. Morgan. Now, no big surprise, Roosevelt is going to go on to win the election in a landslide, securing 56.4% of the popular vote versus 37.6% for Parker, the biggest popular margin since James Monroe's unopposed 1820 re-election. Damn. Roosevelt is going to win the Electoral College 336 to 140, winning every state outside the South. He also won Missouri, which no Republican had done since 1868. Wow. He became the first vice president who succeeded to the presidency upon the president's death to win a term in his own right. Wow. Now, and we've talked about Tyler, Fillmore, Johnson, Arthur, none of them could secure a nomination for a term in their own right. TR, yeah. breaking ground. Mm -hmm. yeah, Republicans they... are also going to increase their majorities in Congress. That's right. Things are looking great. 
Well, after learning of his victory on election night, Roosevelt issued a fateful statement to reporters. Yeah, this is something that he would regret, I think, for the rest of his life. Well, but he it's going to come back to haunt him. Yeah. He said, quote, on the 4th of March next, I shall have served three and a half years, and this three and a half years constitutes my first term. The wise custom which limits the president to two terms regards the substance and not the form. Under no circumstances will I be a candidate for or accept another nomination. Oof. Which at this time he felt, uh... Was noble. He felt like the right thing to do. He had four years ahead of him. He thought that, uh, that would be all he needs. And I mean, we'll get back to that four years from now, but... Speaking of a two-term tradition, yeah, two weeks after the second inauguration, Theodore Roosevelt gave away the bride, his niece Eleanor Roosevelt, at her wedding to their fifth cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Despite being a Democrat, Franklin was modeling his own career on that of Cousin Theodore, whom he would later call the greatest man he ever knew. Interesting stuff. So here we are, Teddy Roosevelt, ready to embark on his second term with a slightly reshuffled cabinet. Cordell Yu is going to be installed as Postmaster General. Attorney General Philander Knox, who had been elected as a senator from Pennsylvania, is going to be replaced by Navy Secretary William Moody, while the Navy Department is taken over by Charles Bonaparte. On July 1st, 1905, Secretary of State John Hay dies in office at the age of 66. Roosevelt is going to persuade Elihu Root, who had left the War Department the previous year, to resume his lucrative career as a corporate lawyer to become the new Secretary of State. But Roosevelt's closest advisor was Root's replacement as War Secretary, William Howard Taft. The two men grew to like each other very much, with Edith Roosevelt opining, quote, they are too much alike. The agreeable Taft was already rumored to be Roosevelt's chosen successor for 1908. As War Secretary, Taft is going to supervise the Isthmian Canal Commission, and he's going to keep watch over the White House when Roosevelt is out of town. Roosevelt's got a strenuous life. He's going hither and thither. That's right. He kept up an extremely active lifestyle as president. In addition to his extended hunting trips, he regularly engaged in tennis, horseback riding, martial arts, cricket, speed reading at a rate of several books per day, mountain climbing, and long hiking excursions. That's it. Roosevelt, like we uh, mentioned before, he was able to uh, digest books like... A normal man would eat a piece of toast. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Yeah, it's really crazy. It really is. And he's going on all these hikes. You know, some foreign nations would take to appointing young, energetic diplomats because they would get more face time with the president if they could physically keep up with him. Yeah, that's pretty crazy to think of. Advisors and diplomats who joined him in his sporting activities were informally known as the tennis cabinet. Right. Mm -hmm. He played frequently with his children, especially his youngest son, Quentin, whose group of friends, known as the White House Gang, engaged in considerable mischief. That's it. Cecil, boys will be boys. Right. Cecil Spring Rice, a British diplomat who had been the best man at Roosevelt's wedding to Edith, said, quote, You must always remember that the president is about six. Yeah. He also took up single sticks, a form of sword fighting with wooden sticks in which he would spar with General Leonard Wood, often resulting in severe bruises. That's it. He's into it. And mm -hmm. those aren't the only injuries caused by his strenuous lifestyle. As he wrote in his own autobiography, quote, While president, I used to box with some of the aides. After a few years, I had to abandon boxing as well as wrestling, for in one bout, a young captain of artillery cross-countered me on the eye, and the blow smashed the little blood vessels. 
Fortunately, it was my left eye, but the sight has been dim ever since, and if it had been the right eye, I should have been entirely unable to shoot. Accordingly, I thought it better to acknowledge that I had become an elderly man and would have to stop boxing. I then took up jujitsu for a year or two. <laughs> yeah. This guy, you know, he's the sitting president. He's boxing with young military men. He gets nearly blinded, and his recourse is to start jujitsu mm -hmm. as an alternative to boxing. Yeah. Imagine that CNN breaking story today that the president <laughs> has been nearly blinded in a boxing match with a young officer. Well, it's unthinkable. Well, we don't have presidents like Teddy Roosevelt anymore. No. And despite his constant activity, he's going to gain considerable weight as president by consuming huge quantities of food, with one close advisor opining that he ate nearly twice as much as the average man. Roosevelt's nonstop lifestyle did take a physical toll. He suffered from rheumatism, stiff joints, high blood pressure, hardening arteries, occasional nervous exhaustion, and intermittent recurrences of malarial fever, which he had contracted in Cuba during the Spanish-American War. John Hay recorded in his diary, quote, The president will of course outlive me, but he will not live to be old. Hmm. Ominous words. That's it. From John Hay. Well, as... Speaking of John Hay, he was kind of on his deathbed, and... When this next foreign policy crisis arose. Yeah, and this is a big one. This mm -hmm. is a pretty direct precursor to World War I, mm -hmm. in a way. So, Yeah, we got a couple of those coming up Yeah, right in a row here. Of course, we're talking about the Russo-Japanese War. During the McKinley administration, the United States had intervened in China alongside Japan and several European powers... To put down the Boxer Rebellion. That's right. As our listeners will remember, that was a violent uprising by which some Chinese sought to expel all foreign influence from the country. Secretary of State Hay had proposed an open door policy whereby foreign powers would keep China open to free trade by all. However, following the Boxer Rebellion, Russia occupied China's northeast Manchuria region. That's Japan. Right. Japan was a rapidly modernizing and expanding power with imperial ambitions of its own. They sought Russian recognition of Japanese influence over Korea. When Russia refused, in February 1904, Japan launched a surprise attack and laid siege to Russia's critical Manchurian naval base of Port Arthur. That's it. Now, Roosevelt is going to be keeping close tabs on this war, and while most European leaders assumed Russia is just going to win, he foresaw the potential for a victorious Japan to alter the world's balance of power. In 1905, after Japan captured Port Arthur and the Russian-held city of Mukden, Roosevelt quietly informed the Japanese government that the U.S. would be happy to help in any effort to reach a negotiated settlement of the war. Though Japan was winning, both sides are pretty exhausted by the war effort, yet both also fear losing face by making a move towards peace. In April 1905, Japan secretly indicates that it would accept Roosevelt as a mediator. In late May, Japan wins a decisive naval battle, sinking most of Russia's Baltic fleet. It's a disaster for the Russians. And yeah, they are driven by labor strikes and threats of revolution. Yeah, Russia's in bad shape. It's ally France begging it to seek peace. Finally, in June, it agrees to Roosevelt's mediation proposal. Yeah. In July, War Secretary Taft and the president's daughter, Alice Roosevelt, are going to lead a congressional delegation on a goodwill tour of the Far East, which included a visit to Japan, where Alice charmed Japanese aristocrats, and Taft secured Japan's blessing for continued American possession of the Philippines 
and also Japan's pledge to maintain the open door policy in China, while Taft conveyed U.S. assent to Japan's expanding influence over Korea. That's right. Some groundwork being laid here. Mm -hmm. In August, Japanese and Russian diplomats meet separately with Roosevelt at his Oyster Bay home, where he is going to encourage the Japanese to moderate their demands for territorial concessions and reparation payments. And he's going to encourage the Russians to be prepared to cede territory and pay reparations if necessary. Then he dined together with both sides, proposing a toast that, quote, a just and lasting peace may be speedily concluded between them. The parties then adjourned to Portsmouth, Maine, which Roosevelt had chosen as the site for the negotiations because Washington, D.C.'s sweltering August heat was unbearable. Unfortunately, negotiations break down in late August over Japan's insistence on reparations and on keeping the Russian island of Sakhalin, which it had recently occupied. With both sides threatening to resume the war, Roosevelt leaned on the Tsar to accept the partition of Sakhalin and told the Japanese that they would spend far more money in renewed fighting than they stood to gain from any reparations. Great mediating, because on August 29th, Japan accepted Russia's offer to conclude peace with a partition of Sakhalin and without any reparations. The Treaty of Portsmouth was signed on September 5th. Henry Adams called Roosevelt, quote, the best herder of emperors since Napoleon. In 1906, President Roosevelt was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts in bringing about an end to the war. That's right. A big achievement. The yep. first president to get it. The first American to get it, actually. I think it was a relatively new award at the time. Oh, yeah, yeah. Pretty new award, but a pretty big deal. Also that year, uh, President Roosevelt is going to give away the bride at the White House wedding of Alice Roosevelt to Ohio Congressman and future House Speaker Nicholas Longworth, the two of whom got engaged following their time together on the Far Eastern Goodwill Tour. That's it. President Roosevelt making Alice another man's problem. We didn't mention, of course, Alice became, you know, a pretty big celebrity when her father became president. And That's right. We we talked all about her on the top five most accomplished presidential daughters. Indeed. Roosevelt famously saying, I can either run the country or control Alice, but I can't do both. Yeah. That's it. Well, also, during these Russo-Japanese negotiations... Germany asks Roosevelt to come out in favor of, of an open-door policy for Morocco, where France's influence dominates. Germany hopes to expand its own imperial influence in North Africa and also break up the Triple Entente alliance of Britain, France, and Russia. Roosevelt refuses to take sides, but he does nudge France towards accepting Germany's demand for an international conference on Morocco. The 1906 conference deadlocked between the Triple Entente on one hand and Germany and Austria on the other. The Kaiser asked the U.S. to mediate a settlement, but while he would have preferred an open door in Morocco, Roosevelt declines to take an active role. Germany ends the conference with a face-saving agreement that mostly upholds French influence. The conference is going to harden the alliances and increase the animosity that will erupt into the First World War a mere eight years later. Wow. But what's going on at home? We, there's been a lot of stuff going on abroad. But, yeah. And mm -hmm. we've, we've had some dealings with big business at home, but... What else is going on back in the States here is well, Roosevelt's in his second term. Yep, and he's going to bring bring an aggressive new agenda domestically for his second term. In his December 1905 State of the Union address, he calls for major regulation of railroad rates 
which continued to be a problem despite the Elkins anti-rebate law of 1903. At the same time, Attorney General William Moody launches a new wave of prosecutions against big corporations and the trusts which had supported Roosevelt's re-election and the old guard conservative congressmen who represent their interests once again close ranks to oppose him. They all got to be friends for election time, but now they're back to opposition. That's it. And of course, popular sentiment favors reform. And Roosevelt can count on support from a new faction of progressive Republicans that are beginning to win congressional seats, including Wisconsin Senator Robert La Follette. A bill sponsored by Iowa Representative William Hepburn proposed to empower the Interstate Commerce Commission to fix just and reasonable rates for railroads. It also allowed the ICC to inspect railroad financial records and mandated standard bookkeeping practices. The bill was vehemently debated in Congress, and Roosevelt joins forces with Democrats, led by Senator Benjamin Tillman, to cobble together a Senate majority. Benjamin Tillman, of course, best known for throwing around the N-word earlier in this episode. That's right. And in the end, conservative Republicans yield when Roosevelt agrees to support an amendment, giving federal courts power to review ICC rate-fixing decisions, and almost all Republicans vote in favor of the final version of the Hepburn Act. Nice. Yep, that December 1905 State of the Union address had also called for regulation of, quote, interstate commerce in misbranded and adulterated foods, drinks, and drugs. Pro-business congressmen initially resisted such legislation, but a popular outcry for regulation was fueled by the 1906 publication of Upton Sinclair's novel The Jungle, an expose of unsanitary conditions in the meatpacking industry. Pretty big game changer. Yep, Roosevelt ordered the Secretary of Agriculture to conduct a secret investigation of the meatpacking industry, which turned out to vindicate Sinclair's charges. In light of all this, opposition to regulation folded, and Congress overwhelmingly passed the Pure Food and Drug Act and the Meatpacking Inspection Act. That's just it. Leading to many good things, but also, unfortunately, this is the environment that also caused Coca-Cola to remove cocaine that's from right. its recipe. So, you take the good with the bad. Yeah, that's it. We're still salty about that here. That's just it. And that's going to lead us now to August 1906, when allegations are made that some members of a U.S. Army battalion of African-American soldiers stationed in Brownsville, Texas, presumably provoked by the town's Jim Crow segregation, had gone on a shooting rampage through the town, resulting in at least one citizen's death. Roosevelt orders a full investigation by the War Department, which concludes that the allegations were true on the basis of local witness statements and spent shell casings that matched the soldiers' weapons. The soldiers denied any knowledge of the incident, and investigators concluded that the unit was engaged in a conspiracy of silence to protect the guilty parties. Roosevelt will accept the War Department's recommendation and dishonorably discharge all 167 soldiers in the battalion without trial. Some of the soldiers had fought bravely in Cuba, and some were close to full retirement and lost their pensions. Black public opinion was outraged. The New York Times argued that there was, quote, not a particle of evidence supporting the decision and Ohio Senator Joseph B. Foraker, who had his eye on the 1908 Republican presidential nomination, secured the opening of a Senate investigation into the matter. Roosevelt engaged in an unseemly back and forth with Foraker at a gridiron club dinner, arguing that his decisions as commander-in-chief were final and that Congress had no power to review them. Following a year-long investigation, the Senate Military Affairs Committee concurred 
in Roosevelt's decision, though a minority report authored by Foraker maintained the soldier's innocence, pointing out evidence that the spent shell casings, the only hard evidence here, had been recovered from the shooting range and were planted in order to frame the black soldiers for an unrelated shooting. Yeah, when this kind of alarm was first raised about this, the soldiers were all in the barracks yeah. and very confused about what they're being accused of. Um, yeah, it turns out this whole thing was a hoax. Yeah. And nasty, nasty business. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, Roosevelt was pretty stubborn about it. I mean, he... Well, when he made up his mind on something, he was affixed to it. He wasn't going to break the other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he took the War Department's recommendations, and then I think he might have regretted making his decision so quickly, but he stuck to it. Yeah, I mean, and it's a black mark on his uh, otherwise, up to this point, pretty solid presidency. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a uh, postscript here in 1972, the Army reinvestigated the affair, and President Nixon posthumously granted pardons and honorable discharges to all of the soldiers involved. Too little, too late. But, Indeed. you know... At least, it was done. Yeah. So, that's not not a good look no. for President Roosevelt. No, it's not. And uh, that's going to bring us back to Cuba. It's been a bit of an issue here. Yeah, well, it's coming back because in August 1906, Cuba's Liberal Party launched an uprising in protest of alleged election rigging by its conservative party president. 1903 treaty gave the U.S. the right to intervene in Cuba to ensure the integrity of its government, and both Cuban factions sought American intervention. They both want to use the Americans to gain leverage against the other side. That's right. Roosevelt is frustrated by this situation, telling an advisor, quote, all that we wanted from them was that they would behave themselves and be prosperous and happy so that we would not have to interfere. He urged the Cubans to sink all differences and reminded them, quote, that the only way they can preserve the independence of their republic is to prevent the necessity of outside interference. But when the Cuban president and his cabinet resigned and the country was left without a government, War Secretary Taft invoked the 1903 treaty, occupying Cuba with 6,000 troops and installing himself as provisional governor. That's right. Roosevelt insisted that the provisional government operate under the Cuban flag and merely maintain order until a new Cuban government could be elected. In 1908, elections were held under American supervision, and when the victorious Liberal Party president took office in February 1909, U.S. forces were withdrawn just before Roosevelt's second term expired. That's it. Well, we've spoken a bit about conservation in regards to Teddy Roosevelt, so let's look at it here in his second term, as he called it, but his first elected. Roosevelt is going to continue to make conservation a priority. In 1906, Congress passes the Antiquities Act, which gives the President authority to proclaim national monuments and historic and prehistoric sites on federal land. Roosevelt is going to use these powers to designate over 15 national monuments, including the Grand Canyon. Roosevelt had created so many new forest reserves that in 1906, Congress passed a bill declaring that the president could not designate more forest reserves in six northwestern states without congressional approval. Roosevelt let the bill sit on his desk while his clerks worked overtime to draft executive orders creating 21 new forest reserves and 11 enlarged ones in those six states. He's not to be trifled with. No. Nope. With anything. Roosevelt signs the executive orders, signs the bill into law. As president, he will quadruple the nation's forest reserves 
from 50 million to 200 million acres. He creates 13 new national forests and initiates 20 irrigation projects under the National Reclamation Act. He also doubled the number of national parks from 5 to 10. In 1907, at his urging, Congress created the Inland Waterways Commission, which the President appointed and charged with preparing, quote, a comprehensive plan for the improvement and control of the river systems of the United States. At this commission's suggestion, Roosevelt called a National Conservation Conference at the White House in May 1908, which was attended by the 50 state governors, the cabinet, the Supreme Court, and members of Congress. Quite a gathering. Mm -hmm. There, he argued that conservation had to be a national priority, saying that we, quote, cannot continue to be civilized and rich unless the nation shows more foresight than we are showing at this moment, as well as arguing that, quote, if we do not exercise that foresight, dark will be the future. TR, making conservation a national priority. It's almost unthinkable today to get all 50 state governors, or, well, it wouldn't have been 50 at the time, but right, yeah, that's to get all, all the state governors together wow. with the Supreme Court and members of Congress and the president. What a dinner. Hmm. I mean, that wouldn't happen today. Yeah, TR wrangling 50 state governors. He's so powerful, he creates governors in states that don't exist that yet. That exist. That yeah. would be our error. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's move on to Japanese immigration. Yeah, a big issue. Because remember uh, from, of course, the Arthur episode, yeah. in the 1880s, lobbying by American labor unions led to the U.S. banning the immigration of Chinese laborers during Roosevelt's second term. A similar issue arising over Japanese immigrants, of which there were large numbers in Hawaii and on the West Coast. Yeah, and it gets ugly. Yep, you got outcries of yellow peril in California where some state authorities are instituting segregation of Japanese children in schools and California's congressmen are seeking a bill to restrict Japanese immigration. However, Japan is not China. Japan is an emerging world power in Roosevelt has great respect for its military prowess and its Pacific naval power. And he considers this immigration question, quote, an immediate source of danger for the country. Japan's government was offended by segregation and immigration restrictions that specifically singled out the Japanese as Japanese. Yeah. And the Secretary of State, Elihi Root, reached an informal gentleman's agreement, whereby Japan would restrict the immigration of its own citizens to the United States, and the federal government would lean on California state authorities to drop segregation. Root drafted an amendment to the immigration bill that gave the president power to restrict alien immigrants generally without singling out the Japanese, and with the expectation that the power would not have to be exercised if Japan upheld its end of the bargain. However, immigrants would continue to pour in from Japan, and anti-immigration riots broke out in California. With some alarmists fearing war was imminent, Roosevelt took the opportunity to dispatch a huge U.S. Navy fleet to the Pacific for training maneuvers, while Root warned Japan that if it did not stop the immigration, Congress would surely pass an exclusion act. These actions prompted Japan to take action and its immigrants declined sharply. Yeah. Now, this is the second time we've talked about TR kind of flaunting our powerful new navy mm -hmm. that is recently successful in war. So, let's talk about his naval policy a little bit. The naval deployment known as the Great White Fleet consisted of 16 warships, and they departed from the Caribbean and circumnavigated the globe between December 1907 and February 1909. Its arrival at San Francisco calmed Westerners' fears of the quote-unquote yellow peril, and 
its warm reception in Japan considerably cooled tensions between the two nations. The expedition provided vital training and experience and announced the U.S. Navy as a global sea power. This is it. The, That's right. the U.S. has not had a significant navy. Now mm -hmm. it finally does. Yeah, in the last, you know, couple decades of the 1800s, they really built it up, and then T.R. kind of kicked it into overdrive. He had called for naval expansion beginning in his first State of the Union address, and uh, during his first term, Congress authorized 31 new vessels, including 10 battleships, in his second term, he requested and received one or two additional battleships each year, including new Dreadnought-class battleships constructed in response to those pioneered by Britain. During his presidency, the U.S. Navy rose from the world's fifth largest to third largest and was second only to Britain in first-class capital ships. They've come a long way in the past couple decades mm -hmm. here, the U.S. Navy. Wow. Need one to be a world power, and TR is determined to have that. That's just it. However, that brings us to October 1907, when a failed attempt by speculators to take over the United Copper Company leads to the collapse of the Knickerbocker Trust Company, one of New York's largest banks, which had financed the takeover attempt. That collapse led to a string of bank failures and a major stock market decline. Roosevelt himself was not well versed in financial policy, and he relied on George B. Cordelieu, whom he had promoted to Treasury Secretary earlier that year. That's it. Cordelieu climbing the ranks. Yep. Cordelieu deposited $69 million in government funds into national banks, while J.P. Morgan organized a group of the nation's wealthiest men, including John D. Rockefeller, E.H. Harriman, and Henry Clay Frick, to pledge their own fortunes to stabilize the markets. The efforts paid off, and stocks rebounded. In November, a renewed crisis threatened when the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company came to the verge of collapse. That's right. The U.S. Steel Corporation offered to buy the company... And despite antitrust concerns, Roosevelt approves the acquisition, which averts the crisis. Wall Street blamed the Panic of 1907 on Roosevelt's trust-busting regulatory actions, but he wrote to his son Kermit, quote, I am absolutely certain that what I have done is right and ultimately will be of benefit to the country. Yep, it ends up being... More of just a hiccup rather than a big financial disaster. That's it. So we're going to keep on trucking after that. Indeed. And Roosevelt, he's going to continue to take on big business in 1908, especially when he makes a concerted push for pro-labor legislation. They had done a 1906 law providing for employers' liability for injured railroad workers, that law was struck down by the Supreme Court. So Roosevelt put together a coalition of Democrats and progressive Republicans to pass a new employer's liability law, which would end up winning the Supreme Court's approval by remaining focused on injuries sustained in interstate commerce. Roosevelt knows how to play the game, boy. Mm-hmm. That same congressional coalition also passed a Workmen's Compensation Act for federal employees, and a law restricting child labor in the District of Columbia. Wow. Winning some points for labor. Well, let's talk about winning some points for progressivism. Yeah, this is a kind of a new shift it, in Roosevelt. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's, there's a bit of a shift coming here. And in the last years of his presidency, Roosevelt becomes more strident in his calls for regulating big business, and he increasingly identifies himself with the emerging progressive wing of the Republican Party. In January 1908, he issued a blazing special message to Congress that deepened the progressive-conservative divide. In it, 
He advocated for his labor law proposals and called for greater regulation of big business, denouncing, quote, huge combinations which are both obnoxious and illegal, and referring to some multimillionaires as, quote, the most dangerous members of the criminal class, criminals of great wealth. He argued that, quote, ultra-conservatives who object to cutting out the abuses will do well to remember that if the popular feeling does become strong, many of those upon whom they rely to defend themselves will be the first to turn against them. The message is going to prompt some conservatives to conclude that Roosevelt has gone insane, with one saying, quote, It reads like the ravings of a disordered mind, and another speculating that the president was, quote, Indulging immoderately in drink and is an opium fiend. Wow. On the other hand, Others are going to praise him for using his high position to call attention to the wrongs that need to be remedied. And one newspaper seriously proposed that he run for president in 1908 as a Democrat, with William Jennings Bryan as his running mate. Wow. But that's just it. The election of 1908's coming up here. Roosevelt's kind of going off on this different tangent amongst this kind of divide that's crept up in in the Republican Party. He's already said he's not going to run in 1908, mm -hmm. and the time has come. Yeah, he doesn't really seem at this point to be regretting his pledge to not no. accept another term. No. He's he's ready to to move on. He feels he's accomplished a lot, and he is repeatedly making clear that he is standing by that pledge as the 1908 approached however he's getting irritated with quote well-meaning but foolish friends who want me to run for a third term the washington post quips that quote there is but one man who can prevent the republican party from nominating theodore roosevelt for re-election in 1908 and that man is theodore roosevelt himself that's it i mean he's still pretty popular he could have got another term if he wanted one. Yeah, it seems like he could have done it with ease. Mm hmm But it's just not done. That's it, no. It's the Washingtonian thing to do. That's Two it. Two terms. Instead, Roosevelt is going to throw his weight behind the even heftier Taft to yep. be his successor. That's a lot of weight, pushing Taft. That's right. Though he privately believes Elihu Root would make a better president, he kind of feels that Root's background as a corporate lawyer makes him unelectable in the current climate. And Root himself actually has no desire to seek the presidency. Uh, so there's that. But Roosevelt, he's going to do what he can to boost Taft over his Republican rivals. He's going to time his January 198 special message to coincide with a planned major speech by New York Governor Charles Evans Hughes, thereby robbing Hughes of headlines and undercutting his momentum. Yeah, all the headlines were about how Roosevelt is crazy and an opium fiend and Hughes is relegated to the back pages. No That's one it. no one noticing that he's trying to get his name out there. Right. And so when the Republican National Convention rolls around Taft is going to win the nomination on the first ballot. That's it. Roosevelt will advise Taft to campaign aggressively, to be sure to smile before audiences, and to attack the record of the Democratic nominee, once again, William Jennings Bryan. He's back. Through press statements and public letters, Roosevelt is going to launch his own attacks on the Democrats. And in November... Taft will win twice as many electoral college votes as Bryan, though his popular vote margin was only half as large as Roosevelt's 19-4 landslide. Roosevelt told a friend that Taft, quote, is going to be greatly beloved as president. I almost envy a man who has a personality like Taft's. No one could accuse me of having a charming personality. That's going to bring us to the final weeks 
of TR's administration, where he will celebrate the end of the intervention in Cuba, welcome the return of the Great White Fleet, and consume himself with plans for a post-presidential African safari. He'll also accept a highly paid position as an editor and contributor for Outlook magazine. That'll bring us hmm. to March 4th, 1909, where TR attends Taft's inauguration and bids goodbye to well-wishers, friends, diplomats, and a tearful White House staff, saying he had, quote, a bully time as president before boarding a train home to New York. Though he's only 50 years old, he's headed for an early retirement. Or is he? We'll find out after these words from our sponsors. Thanks for listening. The Dead Presidents Podcast is brought to you in part by Edwin L. Burdick, president of the Buffalo Envelope Company, who publishes this important announcement. The annual meeting of stockholders of the Buffalo Envelope Company for the purpose of electing a board of directors will be held at the company's office at 45 North Division Street, Buffalo, New York, on February 24th at 12 o'clock noon. If you're like most of our listeners... You have a significant portion of your net worth invested in the Buffalo Envelope Company, and you never miss the annual meeting. We here at the Dead Presidents Podcast have invested a small fortune in the company, an investment which has appreciated exponentially due to the unparalleled business acumen of Edwin Burdick. Edwin Burdick is not just a great businessman, but a great guy, and we can't wait to see him re-elected president at the annual meeting. We know our money is safe with him at the helm. That's a message from our sponsor, Edwin L. Burdick. That's right, James, and we're also proud to be sponsored by Edwin Burdick's wife, Alice, who has a charming notice for the Society Pages. Mrs. Edwin L. Burdick of Ashland Avenue gave a dance for her daughter Marion and her young friends last Thursday evening. The house was decked in the green and red of Christmas tide. Listeners, what a beautiful family. Edwin Burdick has got it all. Not only is he the president of a great company, but he's got a loving wife, a lovely daughter, a fabulous house on Ashland Avenue in the best part of town. This is the American dream, at its most wholesome. I honestly can't help but be jealous. As a matter of fact, I think we all wish... We had Edwin Burdick's life. This just in, we have a breaking news update. Edwin Burdick has been brutally murdered. Edwin L. Burdick, president of the Buffalo Envelope Company, was murdered last night or early this morning at his Ashland Avenue home. The back of his skull was battered in. Two fingers of his left hand were broken and there were other injuries inflicted on his body. The corpse was found by Mr. Burdick's mother-in-law when she entered the smoking room of the house at about 8 o'clock this morning. The best detectives in the city are at work on the case, but as yet they have no suspects. Evidently, robbery was not the motive, as nothing is missing from the house. Listeners, we are shocked beyond belief. Edwin Burdick's idyllic life wow. cruelly brought to a sudden and senseless end. How could this have happened to such a perfect family? We have another breaking news update. It has come to light that Edwin and Alice Burdick had both filed for divorce, each accusing the other of adultery. They are reported by their neighbors to have quarreled frequently and upon more than one occasion are said to have engaged in hot words. In fact, their differences were the subject of neighborhood gossip. At least three women suspected of connections to Mr. Burdick have been questioned by detectives but were exonerated 
when no evidence was found linking them to the murder. Listeners, we are heartbroken to learn the shameful private details of this marriage and are deeply disappointed to learn that Edwin might have been unfaithful to Alice. I, for one, refuse to believe that Alice could be guilty of a similar indiscretion, but I have to wonder, where was she when all this went down? It's just in, we have another update. It has been confirmed that Alice Burdick was in Atlantic City on the night of the murder, and it is said that when she left home, she had no intention of returning. However, detectives have questioned Arthur Pennell, a local attorney who we learn was named as a co-respondent in the divorce action filed by Edwin Burdick, who accused Pennell of alienating the affections of Mrs. Burdick. It has been bandied about that Mr. Burdick had surveilled them to a Niagara Falls hotel where Mrs. Burdick was registered as Pennell's wife. Mr. Pennell and his actual wife live in the same neighborhood and are said to have once been close friends of the Burdicks. It is a common rumor that Mr. Burdick and Mr. Pennell made threats against one another and a collision between them was expected by their acquaintances. Mr. Burdick is said to have remarked that sooner or later he would kill Mr. Pennell, while Mr. Pennell retorted that he was willing to wager that he wouldn't be the one to end up with the coroner. Mr. Pennell told detectives that he was at home on the night of the murder, and Mrs. Pennell has reportedly corroborated his story. However, it is said that Mr. Pennell previously told Mrs. Burdick that he would divorce his wife and marry her, but that Mrs. Pennell, who knew all about the affair, still refuse to grant him a divorce. Listeners, this sordid tale keeps getting more sordid. This Arthur Pennell is a shady character and seems like a prime suspect here. I'm not too sure I believe Mrs. Pennell's convenient alibi. I think we need to hear a lot more from both of them. <sighs> What's this, James? I'm receiving word here now that we have yet another breaking news update. Arthur Pennell was killed instantly last night when his automobile fell to the bottom of a deep stone quarry. His wife, who accompanied him, was so badly injured that she is expected to die. Mrs. Pennell was found moaning piteously, with blood pouring from her mouth and a gash gleaming across the whiteness of her forehead, a gash caused when her head struck against a jagged rock leaving her with a fractured skull. Death came to Mr. Pennell suddenly and with brutal superfluity of force. The top of his skull was lying at a little distance from the car, and his brains were spilled as the yolk from a shattered egg. His body was broken and dismembered and had to be gathered up and placed in a wicker basket. Authorities believe it was an accident, but have not ruled out suicide. Listeners, this graphic scene has shaken us to our very core. We're hoping against hope that Mrs. Pennell pulls through and perhaps has some information that could shed a sliver of light on this baffling catastrophe. Actually, I'm being told that it's just been made official. Mrs. Pennell is dead. Well, there you have it, listeners. The detectives have no more leads, and it now appears that the impenetrable mystery of Edwin Burdick's heinous murder will never be solved. But that leaves a potentially more important question, one that we know is burning in the forefront of our listeners' minds. What's happening to the stock values of the Buffalo Envelope Company? We here at the Dead President's Podcast unloaded our shares immediately upon learning of Edwin Burdick's death, and we're sure glad we got out when we did, but, <laughs> you know, right now it's tanking. Uh, we hate to be the bearers of bad news uh, to the majority of our listeners who are currently heavily invested in the Buffalo Envelope Company, but the fact of the matter is, you're broke. And now, back to the show. We're 
we have left off a 50-year-old Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah, we're ready to dive into his post-presidential life. A lot of times, you know, post-presidential life is a eh, couple of bullet points, not all that much happening. Yeah. Here we've got, you know, pretty much the youngest. I mean, he was the youngest man to become president, so he's very young as a post-president. In a lot of ways, he, like, rose too fast. He reached the pinnacle of power and of accomplishment too early, and now yeah. he's facing, looking at the rest of his life, not knowing what to do. Yeah. And someone it. who is as active as him and as nonstop is going to have trouble retiring. I mean, he's got to do something, and that may end up getting him into a little bit of trouble, kind of. Yeah. He kind of loses his way, perhaps. But he's certainly not going to lose any time jumping into things headlong, because within weeks of Taft's inauguration, Roosevelt leaves the U.S. He's headed to British East Africa, now Kenya. He is accompanied by his 19-year-old son Kermit and a team of scientists financed by Andrew Carnegie. The expedition sets out to collect specimens for the Smithsonian Institute. From April 1909 to March 1910, they trek through British East Africa and Uganda to the Belgian Congo and Northern Sudan. The expedition collected over 11,000 animal specimens, including over 500 larger animals shot by Roosevelt and Kermit, among them lions, cheetahs, leopards, ostriches, Buffalo, wildebeest, zebras, rhinos, hippos, giraffes, and elephants. And T.R. wrote extensively about his lion hunts and his other hunting journeys, uh, writing one time about first hearing the roar of the lion. And I quote, let me begin with a description of the lion's roar. It is impossible to describe the roar of the lion, but I can describe its effect. You feel it first in your scrotum, and then the nipples on your ass become erect, and the hair on the tip of your penis springs forth. I'm Wait. sorry. That's not, that's not Teddy Roosevelt. No. That's Edmund Premington. That's right. I got him mixed up. Edmund Premington, of course, writer, explorist, traveler, noveler, famous for his description of the lion's roar. Which isn't too dissimilar from Teddy Roosevelt's. No, Teddy Roosevelt wrote of his lion hunt, quote, Right in front of me, thirty yards off, there appeared from behind the bushes, which had first screened him from my eyes, the tawny, galloping form of a big, maneless lion. Crack! The Winchester spoke, and as the soft-nosed bullet plowed forward through his flank, the lion swerved so that I missed him with the second shot, but my third bullet went through the spine and forward into his chest, down he came, his hindquarters dragging, his head up, his jaws open, and lips drawn in a prodigious snarl, and as he endeavored to turn and face us, his back was broken, his head sank, and he died. Ugh. Wow. Roosevelt, quite the hunter. Yeah, yeah. I believe he hit all those shots on a lion when... The tingle of fear must have been constricting his scrotum. And each and every one of his scrotums, James. And Teddy Roosevelt himself was sensitive about criticism for unnecessary killing and strictly limited his hunting to specimens the expedition wanted. In one incident, he was seeking a large bull hippo when a herd of submerged hippos swarmed his boat and knocked him down. He fired off a flurry of shots in self-defense and was upset to discover that he had killed four cows in addition to a bull. Yeah, he was upset about that incident and was like, oh, I don't know what to do. We got to tell the reporters. Like he felt it was something he had to come clean about immediately, even yeah. though hippos are the most deadly animal in Africa in terms of the number of humans they kill. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's definitely lucky he didn't get killed there. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to become... 
something unfamiliar here. <laughs> yeah. He's not going to sit at home in his rocking chair in retirement. Certainly not. Uh, he's going to publish a book chronicling this expedition called African Game Trails, for which he received more money than any of his previous books. Roosevelt, pretty accomplished author. Mm -hmm. He's churning them out. That expedition will end in March 1910, over a, he's, that's his holy first year out of the presidency. Yeah. He emerges from the African wilderness when he is reunited with Edith in Khartoum, Sudan, which was then a British Egyptian protectorate. They traveled down the Nile to Egypt, where Roosevelt gave a speech at Cairo University in which he condemned the recent assassination of Egypt's prime minister by Egyptian nationalists, ignoring British advice to avoid the touchy subject and warnings from Egyptian nationalists that he might suffer the same fate well, if he brings it up. Never wanted to back down nope. and always wanted to speak his mind. Mm -hmm. From there, he's going to move on to Europe, where in Rome he declines to meet with Pope Pius X because the Pope had offered to meet with him only on the condition that he did not meet with Roman Protestants. In Vienna, T.R. dines with the Austro-Hungarian Emperor Franz Josef and the heir apparent, Franz Ferdinand, whom he privately described as, quote, a furious reactionary. Yeah, that's a name you might want to remember later. Mm -hmm. In Paris, he gave a speech at the Sorbonne, which included the famous Man in the Arena passage that we quoted at the beginning of the episode. That's it. He gave another speech in Berlin, where he finally met the Kaiser, Wilhelm II, face to face. And afterwards, he wrote that the Kaiser, quote, seriously believed himself to be a demigod. Yeah. At the Kaiser's request, he reviewed German army training maneuvers and would write to Edith, quote, I'm absolutely certain now that we're all in for it. Facts and figures aren't half so convincing as the direct scrutiny of a thing, especially a thing so monstrous as this. Well, I mean, fortunately, Germany won't have anybody worse than Kaiser Wilhelm II, like, to deal with in their future. Well, that's a Franklin Roosevelt episode, spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> While T.R. was in Germany, King Edward VII of England died, and he accepted Taft's invitation to serve as the U.S. representative at the funeral. In England, he met with many members of the government and aristocracy, including the new King George V, and he gave a speech at Oxford University. At Edward VII's funeral, he met many other monarchs, including the King of Spain, who said, quote, I have admired your career, and I have also admired your military career though I am sorry that your honors should have been won at the expense of my countrymen. Well, that's awkward. Yeah. Well, he was very well received in Europe. When he returned to the U.S. in June 1910, a French newspaper wrote, quote, Never since Napoleon dawned on Europe has such an impression been produced there as has been made by Theodore Roosevelt. That's Back. some pretty strong words. Yeah, many of those crowned heads of Europe were cultivating his favor on the assumption that he would soon be president again. Yeah. And that's going to bring us to the Republican schism. Now, we talked about the rift starting to form in the Republican Party between mm -hmm. progressives which is this new thing springing forward, and that's kind of where T.R.'s heart lies. Mm -hmm. Now, he avoids newspapers when he's in Africa, but he receives letters from Henry Cabot Lodge and other friends critical of President Taft and expressing concern about Republican Party unity. In Italy, T.R. meets with Gifford Pinchot, the radical conservationist whom Taft had recently fired as chief of the Forest Service and who expressed extreme hostility toward the Taft administration. This disappoints Roosevelt. He is actually bummed and kind of takes it personal that Taft doesn't consult him on some of these appointments. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though Taft retains some of them, he uh, 
gets personally bothered when Taft replaces others, and Taft ends up writing to him, quote, I have been conscientiously trying to carry out your policies, but my method of doing so has not worked smoothly. Roosevelt will politely decline Taft's invitation to visit the White House, but he doesn't go so far as to publicly criticize Taft, despite increasing entreaties from progressive Republicans to challenge Taft for party leadership in what seems to be a splintering party. Yeah, that could be in the works. Roosevelt is going to obtain Taft's support for a New York State bill being pushed by Governor Charles Evans Hughes to adopt primary elections, a measure that could curb the influence of party machine bosses. That bill is going to be defeated, not coincidentally, by the combined efforts of the Republican and Democratic machine bosses. Yeah. <laughs> and Roosevelt and Taft, that was the last time they're going to work together. Yeah. Unfortunately. Roosevelt becoming an increasingly liberal progressive, seeing Taft as a tool of the conservative party machine. 1910 election season is rolling around. TR is going to go on a Western campaign tour to support Republican candidates. When he's in Kansas, he gives a major speech promoting a progressive program that he's going to call New Nationalism. Yeah. He's going to favor labor over capital, involve even more strict regulation of corporations. Among his new progressive stances, he assails the independent judiciary for allegedly thwarting the will of the people, arguing that judicial decisions should be subject to to overturning by Democratic vote and judges subject to recall from office. Positions that appalled once in future Judge Taft. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's a pretty strong speech. And it makes national headlines. The New York Post notes, quote, He never once mentioned the party to which he is supposed to belong, nor referred in the remotest way to the president. What are we to make of this? Are we to infer that Mr. Roosevelt proposes to found and head a new party made up of elements from both the old ones? Is this speech to be taken as a bold bid for the presidency in 1912? Wow. Yeah. Roosevelt is going to take his crusade against political machines to the 1910 New York State Republican Convention where he challenges Taft's vice president, James Sherman, a favorite of conservatives, for chairmanship of the convention. Roosevelt wins the chairmanship and secures the nomination of progressive Republican candidates. On election day, however, Democrats sweep the New York state elections and also win control of the U.S. House of Representatives. Yeah, whatever's going on in the Republican Party is, well, it's making Democrats happy. Yeah. It's not so great for necessarily Republicans or progressive Republicans at this point. Things and considering how strong the Republican Party has been in recent decades, you know, yeah, they've outside been pretty... of Grover Cleveland there intermittently, uh, mm -hmm. they haven't had a great deal of success, but... It looks like yeah, well, the, Re the Republicans are now facing things that used to eat at the Democrats. Yeah, the Republican Party has been pretty dominant for a while, and that's kind of a trend that when one party becomes too dominant, it kind of fractures. Yep, when, splits within itself. And that's what we see happening here in Roosevelt and Taft becoming the figureheads of that. I think this split definitely exacerbated by the fact that you got Roosevelt, an ex-president who was hugely successful. And immensely popular. Yeah. Not a lot of kind of third parties get off the ground, but if they have somebody like Teddy Roosevelt at the top of them, you got to take them seriously immediately. Yeah. I mean, it could be likened to, say, George Washington being dissatisfied with John Adams and then trying to come back as an independent. Yeah. You know, 
It's it's kind of that level. Something like that, yeah. You know. But in uh, April of 1911, Roosevelt is going to write an editorial criticizing Taft-supported treaty proposals for settling international disputes by arbitration, arguing that the U.S., quote, ought never specifically to bind itself to arbitrate questions respecting its honor, independence, and integrity. In October 1911, the Taft administration sued U.S. Steel for antitrust violations over its 1907 acquisition of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, arguing that President Roosevelt had been deceived by the monopolistic intent of the deal. The Taft administration highlighted its many antitrust prosecutions and advertised Taft as a more formidable trust buster than even Roosevelt, who defended his own reputation in an editorial that served as an open break with the Taft administration. Yeah, things are really starting to go down here. Yeah. There was, I think, a period of just kind of tension where neither of them were talking to each other and just growing farther apart, and now it's really starting to break into the open. It is. November 1911, a group of Ohio Republicans led by James R. Garfield, That's right. son of President Garfield, Roosevelt's interior secretary, who had been replaced by Taft, they endorsed Roosevelt for president. He makes no statement about refusing to run or anything like that. Instead, he says privately, quote, I am, re I am really sorry for Taft. I am sure he means well, but he means well feebly, and he does not know how. He is utterly unfit for leadership, and this is a time when we need leadership. Pretty harsh. Now he starts to kind of reinterpret the two-term tradition yeah. that he had previously supported. Now he's saying, well, that applies to an incumbent seeking a consecutive third term. That's right. Once you leave office for four years, all bets are off. Yeah, that's it. And that's going to lead us to 1912 in January, of which TR says, quote, if the people make a draft on me, I shall not decline to serve. And in February, he said, quote, I will accept the nomination for president if it is tendered to me. And my hat is in the ring. 1912 sees the first widespread primary elections, a reform favored by the progressives. Now, about one third of the states have adopted primaries, while others still select national convention delegates via state party conventions. Taft dominates among conservatives and party regulars, and so he amasses delegates through state conventions, especially in the South. Roosevelt is going to win most of the primary states, including a decisive victory in Taft's home state of Ohio one after both candidates had crisscrossed the state giving campaign speeches. To be to be fair, Taft won Roosevelt's home state of New York in yeah, the primary. That's right. But so, yeah, and like we were talking about before, uh a lot of times it would be back porch campaign speeches mm -hmm. and gatherings. These guys are crisscrossing the state. Yeah. Roosevelt is gonna win about fifty one percent of the primary vote. 35% going to Taft. Progressive Republican Wisconsin Senator Robert La Follette won 13%. And that's going to bring us to the Republican National Convention. You that's got a it. lot of delegates decided by state party conventions. You got the state primary delegates. And there's a lot of controversy going on about these delegates. The convention takes place in Chicago in June. You need a majority of 540 delegates to win the nomination, Roosevelt gearing up to challenge the credentials of many Taft delegates, arguing that they had been obtained by fraud, corruption, or bribery, although some of Roosevelt's own delegates had been garnered by questionable means. That's it. Machine, politicians, all kind of stuff, a lot of dirty accusations going around that's it and uh taft supporters however are going to control the party's executive committee 
and they successfully engineered the selection of Elihu Root as convention chairman. With cold-blooded, lawyerly efficiency, Root overrules a Roosevelt supporter's motion that only unchallenged delegates should vote on whether challenged delegates should be seated. This is a pretty big move. Well, it's going to enable TAP supporters to throw out most of Roosevelt's challenges. That's it. Most of the challenged Taft delegates get seated, and that leaves a Taft majority sufficient to win the nomination on the first ballot. Yeah. Roosevelt, none too pleased, goes on to denounce Root as a, quote, receiver of stolen goods, and most of his delegates protested the convention by declaring themselves, quote, present and not voting. Then they bolted the Republican Party, adjourning to a separate location where Roosevelt agreed to accept the presidential nomination of a third party progressive party. When Roosevelt said, quote, I'm feeling like a bull moose, cartoonists seized on the image, and the party became popularly known as the Bull Moose Party. Damn. So no, we've it's... had a full break. In the Republican Party. It's going down. We've talked before about people bolting a convention. Mm-hmm. Well, here we are again, and a new party has now sprung up. The Bull Moose Party. Well, what does it look like for the Bull Moose Party? Well, TR's electoral prospects are going to suffer a blow when Democrats nominate a progressive of their own. Woodrow Wilson... The Princeton University president who'd spent the past two years enacting some moderate progressive reforms as governor of New Jersey, somebody who is also going to have some appeal for progressives that TR is desperately going to need if he's going to That's it. win this election. He also learns once he bolts that a lot of progressive Republicans who are already in public office are reluctant to join him in bolting for fear of ruining their careers. Yeah. But his new progressive party is going to race to organize itself as a formal party and to field a full slate of candidates in races throughout the country. That's just it. They go on to hold a national convention in Chicago in August where TR is formally nominated and California Governor Hiram Johnson is chosen as his running mate. One of the party's biggest financial backers was George Perkins, Roosevelt's friend and J.P. Morgan's partner. Named party executive secretary, Perkins blocked an antitrust plank from inclusion in the party platform. To avoid alienating white Southern supporters, Roosevelt decided to exclude black Southerners from the convention, though he welcomed black delegates from northern states. Though he had never been particularly religious, he adopted a somewhat religious fervor that was kind of prominent among some of these fellow progressives and concluded his rousing acceptance speech with, quote, We stand at Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. Mm. Sounds like these progressives might be taking themselves a little bit too seriously. Yeah. Meanwhile, they're supposedly on this idealistic crusade, and yet they find themselves making the same kind of, like, cold-blooded, politically calculated moves, like appeasing a J.P. Morgan partner because he donates a lot of money to the party and yeah. kicking black delegates out of the convention yeah. to try to win white Southerner supporters. Yeah. It seems like the focus is is starting to wane here. Yeah, well, Roosevelt admitted in a letter to Kermit, quote, of course, I do not believe for a moment that we shall win. But he felt compelled to avenge what he saw as a corrupt Republican convention and to avoid disappointing his own supporters. I think part of the problem is all these progressives are very enthusiastic, and if they have someone like TR as their standard bearer, they feel like they have a chance. Yeah. He doesn't want to let them all down, but they still don't really have a chance. Yeah, and he per and he knows it. 
because you got Wilson. He's backed by a united and well-funded Democratic Party. They're trying to. They're going to take this chance to. Yeah, the Democratic Party uh, has made some strides since the failed uh, attempts with William Jennings Bryan three different times. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are pretty solidly together, especially right now mm-hmm. when they see how splintered the Republicans are. And that's not going to do TR or the progressives any favors. No, he he doesn't. He knows he's not going to beat Wilson, but he's hoping that he'll at least beat Taft. Right. Which seems kind of petty, but. Well, it, it would. I think it's like a personal victory for him. Mm-hmm. Oh, and we, uh, Alice we... supports her father's campaign, but her husband, Nick Longworth, a longtime Taft man who represents Taft's home district in Congress, remains loyal to Taft. So. Mm, even a riff within the family. Yeah, we started the episode talking about husbands and wives maybe on opposite sides of the Civil War. Now we have another lower-grade Civil War going on. That's it. Yeah, uh, TR you know, told Nick Longworth, you know, of course you have to support Taft. Go ahead. You have my blessing. But Alice is like at campaign events in Cincinnati for the Progressive Party. Yeah. Basically running against her husband's reelection. That's it. And spoiler alert, he's going to lose and not be returned to Congress in this election. Yeah. He'll end up back in there later, but this is contributing to a pretty big rift in their marriage. That's it. And that's going to bring us to Roosevelt embarking on a pretty aggressive campaign tour, uh, knowing that neither the professorial Wilson nor the long-winded Taft could match his energetic speaking style. On October 12th, Roosevelt was on his way to a speech in Milwaukee when he stopped to acknowledge a cheering crowd outside his hotel. Among the crowd was John Schrank, a delusional Bavarian immigrant who had endured much family tragedy and who had had a dream in which he was visited by the ghost of William McKinley, who told him to avenge his assassination and pointed to a picture of Roosevelt. From seven feet away, Shrank shot Roosevelt with a thirty-eight caliber Colt revolver. The bullet lodged in Roosevelt's chest muscle after hitting his steel eyeglass case and a folded copy of his 50-page speech, which were in his breast pocket. The crowd was ready to tear Shrank apart when Roosevelt said, not dissimilarly to McKinley after being shot, don't hurt him, bring him here. He took Shrank's head in both hands and asked, what did you do it for? Getting no response, he said, what's the use? Turn him over to the police, you poor creature. See that there is no violence done to him. Now, holy shit, first yeah. off. But you got to remember, T.R. is an experienced hunter, and he he knows that he's not mortally wounded. Well, yeah, he knows that if, his, if the bullet has reached his lungs, he'd be coughing blood. Yeah. And uh, he's not, so it must not have. His aides say, hey, let's go to the hospital. He refuses, saying, quote, you get me to that speech. Yeah. So and then, like this a complete guy... <laughs> fucking badass, he proceeds to deliver the speech, as planned, speaking for over 80 minutes, as blood seeps into his shirt, telling the crowd, quote, Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you fully understand that I have just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Damn. Damn! Full beast mode, Teddy mm-hmm. Roosevelt. He goes to the hospital after the speech. The doctors determine that it would be more dangerous to try to remove the bullet, so he would carry it in his chest muscle for the rest of his life. Wow. John Schrank was determined to be suffering from, quote, insane delusions, grandiose in character, and he would spend the rest of his life in a hospital for the criminally insane. He would reach 
the greatest peaks of his historical reputation when he earned the number two spot on our list of the top five failed assassins. That's right. And after spending a week in the hospital, T.R. is back on the campaign trail, delivering a speech at Madison Square Garden. Wow. Yeah. Well, and what was it all for? Election results come in on November 5th. Woodrow Wilson wins the presidency with 435 electoral votes against 88 for Theodore Roosevelt, 8 for William Howard Taft. Yeah. The worst showing ever by an incumbent president Mm -hmm. in the Electoral College. Wilson won 42% of the popular vote, 27% for Roosevelt, 23% for Taft, 6% going to socialist candidate Eugene V. Debs. So Wilson won 40 states. Yeah. But in only 13 southern states did he poll better than Roosevelt and Taft's combined total. Which is kind of wild. I mean... For a Democrat in the South. Well, those 13... I mean, those 13 southern states are probably... You know, like the exact ones won by Alton B. Parker. Yeah. Like, theoretically, if all the Taft and Roosevelt voters had been on the same team, they'd have crushed the Democrats just like they'd been doing for the past several elections. Yeah. Roosevelt won the states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, Minnesota, California, South Dakota, and Washington. Taft won only Utah and Vermont. Yeah. Roosevelt's 88 electoral votes are the most ever won by a third-party candidate. On election night, Roosevelt called Wilson to congratulate him and told reporters, quote, Like all other good citizens, I accept the result with good humor and contentment. So, that's that. I hope you're happy. Yeah. After the election, T.R. signs a lucrative contract to publish an autobiography. And why not? I mean, he's already an acclaimed author. Mm -hmm. He initially dictated stories to an editor who interviewed him, but became self-conscious about revealing anything sensational or personal and decided to write the rest of the book himself. The result was very impersonal. He didn't mention his first wife at all and barely mentioned his second wife or his children. He omitted uncomfortable episodes like his failed New York City mayor's race and his brother Elliot's troubles. The book ended with the end of his presidency and did not address the 1912 elections. Yeah, I mean, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of good stuff in there, but also a lot of missed opportunities. He's the kind of guy who, like, he doesn't dwell on anything bad, he doesn't record anything bad yeah he's a really interesting personality because he can be brash and outspoken Mm -hmm. but when it comes to personal stuff Mm -hmm. he closes up and doesn't like to really talk about Mm -hmm. that yeah one of the yeah an interesting thing like way back when he was in college and he was courting alice his first wife He's keeping a diary, and then during the times when it's kind of not going so well between him and it's not looking good for his chances, he's, like, ripping pages out of his diary. He's not, like, he's not writing down the tough parts. Yeah. Um, And that's something that carried all the way here into his autobiography. Yeah. Yeah, there was, like, an inner kind of personal struggle Mm -hmm. going on there a bit. Now, in 1913, Roosevelt brought a libel lawsuit against the publisher of a Michigan newspaper over an editorial during the 1912 election, alleging that Roosevelt was a drunkard. These kinds of rumors, they're often widely published, often by Republican newspapers who felt betrayed when Roosevelt bolted the party. And he selected the Michigan newspaper to sue because he felt it presented the clearest case of libel. Yeah, he wanted to vindicate himself. 
pretty much back, at least since his 1908 special message, conservatives who thought he went crazy calling him, you know, he must be drunk or on yeah. opium. Well, he's going to prove in court that he was not. Yeah. He testified at trial, quote, I have never been drunk or in the slightest degree under the influence of alcohol. And he had a parade of prominent witnesses who confirmed that he rarely drank alcohol and only in small quantities. The publisher admitted that his sources did not have evidence to back up their claims of Roosevelt's drunkenness. And he argued that he had acted in good faith and without malice. With that admission, Roosevelt decided to act for, ask for only nominal damages, and he won the lawsuit and a damages award of six cents. Yeah. But he vindicated his name. That's right. He's perhaps the only president who has legal proof that he is not a drunkard. Yeah. And uh, now here in 1915, Roosevelt is sued for libel by New York Republican Party boss William Barnes whom he had accused of corruption in a statement published in 1914. Roosevelt testified for eight days during the five-week trial, and his witnesses included Assistant Secretary of the Navy Franklin D. Roosevelt, who testified that Barnes had worked with the Tammany Hall Democratic Party boss during FDR's tenure in the state legislature. The jury found in Roosevelt's favor, and the verdict marked the beginning of the end of Barnes's control of the New York Republican machine. Yeah. Roosevelt's spending a lot of his time in courtrooms in libel suits. Yeah, that's probably bothering him a little bit. I bet he, he's got to get out and stretch his legs a little bit. Well, he's going to go on another big expedition. That's it. In late 1913, he traveled to South America, where his friend the Catholic priest and scientist father, John Zom, had invited him for a relatively leisurely tour, sponsored by the American Museum of Natural History. It was to include hunting, naturalism, and speaking engagements. When he arrived in Brazil, however, the Brazilian government proposed that his team, which included Kermit and several scientists, instead join a potentially dangerous and grueling expedition led by Brazilian explorer Colonel Candido Rondon to chart the unexplored course of the Rio de Duvida, the River of Doubt, a mysterious river that possibly flowed into the Madeira, a major tributary of the Amazon. Yeah. So it goes from, oh, let's take a leisurely trip, to here is a grueling and potentially fatal adventure that awaits you. And so what's Roosevelt going to do? He's going to jump at the chance to literally put an unknown river on the map. The Roosevelt-Rondon Scientific Expedition set off in December 1913 and reached the recently discovered headwaters of the River of Doubt in late February 1914 and headed downriver. The expedition is going to face many difficulties. Dwindling food precisions, disease-carrying insects, canoes that were repeatedly lost or destroyed in the river's dangerous rapids, and impassable sections of river forcing them to portage around by dragging their canoes overland through the jungle. On March 14th, Kermit and two Brazilians were exploring a river channel when they were overcome by rapids and one of the Brazilians was swept away. His body was never recovered, and Roosevelt worried for Kermit's safety, as some of the Brazilians may have blamed Kermit for their comrade's death. Wow. Things yeah. are getting dicey. It's getting a little dicey. This is becoming kind of scary. One of the expedition's dogs was found killed, presumably by a Native American tribe that would have never before encountered white men. Yeah. They're going in totally unexplored jungle territory here. And as they move on, they're living in fear of sudden attacks by natives yep. who are perhaps lurking right behind the riverbank in the jungle. They have no idea. On March 31st, one of the Brazilian members of the expedition shot and killed another one of the Brazilians and then disappeared into the jungle. Wow. Roosevelt wanted to search for him and bring him to justice, but Rondon 
convinced him that a search was futile and that the murderer could not survive long in the jungle alone. The expedition moved on, now in fear that this murderer might reappear to steal their food or kill someone else. That's it. His presumed death brought the expedition's death toll to three out of just 19 members. The party was forced onto a near-starvation diet, and Kermit began to worry about his father's heart as Roosevelt began suffering from increased fatigue, exacerbated by the bullet still lodged in his chest. Yeah, that's it. On April 1st, he began to suffer a recurrence of his old Cuban malaria. His fever quickly rose to 104 degrees, and he became delirious. Kermit feared he would die, and Roosevelt told Rondon, quote, The expedition cannot stop. On the other hand, I cannot continue. You go on, and leave me. Wow. Another cinematic moment in the life of TR. Really? You've seen that in, in how many movies? Like, no, go on and leave me here to leave die. Me. Just leave me. A former president, maybe the most famous man in the world. Eh, just leave me here to die. Yeah. Rondon, of course, refused. And the expedition would carry Roosevelt along for the next few days... While his fever dropped. Yeah, Roosevelt becoming like Jack Hawkins in Bridge on the River Kwai <laughs> there. <laughs> he's going to continue to suffer from dysentery, and he's going to end up losing 55 pounds. Jesus. He had suffered an injury to his right leg in a canoe accident. That's now going to become infected. And then the old injury to his left leg from the 1902 trolley accident is going to flare up, leaving him unable to walk. Yeah. Then, an abscess will form on his buttocks, leaving him unable to sit. As though things couldn't get any worse. Well, they're about to get better, because in mid-April, the river opened up to allow faster passage, and the party began to encounter fishermen and rubber tappers, indicating that they were back in civilization. On April 26th, they encountered one of Rondon's lieutenants, who had been sent up the Arapuana River to its confluence with an unknown river that they had correctly guessed might be the River of Doubt. As it was no longer in doubt, on April 27th, an informal ceremony was held to rename it the Roosevelt River. That's it. The expedition had traversed and charted over 600 miles of river. They took a steamboat to the Amazon, and Roosevelt arrived back in New York on May 19th. A week later, he addressed the National Geographic Society in Washington, D.C., where he also had a cordial meeting with President Wilson at the White House. In June, he traveled to Madrid, where Kermit married the daughter of the U.S. ambassador to Spain. In London, he addressed the Royal Geographic Society and pointed out how a 1911 British map of Brazil was grossly inaccurate. Yep. Wow. It's a pretty intense expedition. Indeed. I mean, once you get out there, out beyond the bounds of civilization, you're at the mercy of whatever comes by. And... That's it. But he had no fear, because it's like he, he's faced death so mm -hmm. many times. Yeah. Well, he certainly almost died there. Mm -hmm. That would have been crazy end to a president's life. Indeed. Well, he's going to be cooking up perhaps an even crazier end to his life if he gets his way in some of these upcoming incidents. That's right, because TR returns to the U.S. just before the June 28th, 1914 assassination of Franz Ferdinand by Bosnian Serb Gavrilo Princip. Yep, as we said, assassinations were in the air at the time, and that's just it. This is the mother of all assassinations. Right. Russia opposed Austrian efforts to punish Serbia, and by August, war breaks out between Germany and Austria against Russia, France, and Britain. Roosevelt initially supports Wilson's policy of neutrality and non involvement but he privately expresses his misgivings about the president and secretary of state, William Jennings Bryan, saying, quote, It is not a good thing for the country to have a professional yodeler, a human trombone like Mr. Bryan, as secretary of state, 
nor a college president with an astute and shifty mind, a hypocritical ability to deceive plain people, and no real knowledge or wisdom concerning internal and international affairs as head of the nation. Oof! A scathing indictment. Yes. Of Wilson's leadership potential. Roosevelt is going to express deep sympathy for Belgium when Germany brutally violates its neutrality in order to take a more convenient path toward invading France. Roosevelt is going to begin preaching the need for the United States to be prepared for war, even as it remains neutral. He becomes increasingly critical of, quote, weaklings who raise their shrill piping for peace and argued that, quote, to be neutral between right and wrong is to serve wrong. Hmm. Things are getting pretty dicey. That's just it. And Germany's submarine campaign against Britain increasingly threatens neutral America's trade, culminating in the May 1915 sinking of the British ship Lusitania, which resulted in the deaths of 128 American passengers. When Wilson responded that, quote, There is such a thing as a man being too proud to fight, Roosevelt lambasted him as a coward. Roosevelt, perhaps, too proud not to fight. Yeah. Wilson went on to accept Bryan's resignation from the State Department, secured a pledge from Germany to mitigate its submarine campaign, and took some steps towards military preparedness. And, well, there's some shit going down now. Mm -hmm. Well, there's another war, potentially of interest to both Wilson and Roosevelt, going on in Mexico, where a revolution had been underway since 1910. Back in 1911, Roosevelt wrote a letter to President Taft, saying, quote, I earnestly hope that we will not have to intervene but if by any remote chance there should be a serious war, a war in which Mexico was backed by Japan or some other big power, then I would wish immediately to, to apply for permission to raise a division of cavalry, much as the regiment I commanded in Cuba. Yeah. President, or ex-president TR, itching for another chance. At, at the glory at of battle. battle. Mm-hmm. Well, in March 1916... The Mexican guerrilla leader Pancho Villa raided across the border and attacked the town of Columbus, New Mexico, killing 18 Americans and prompting President Wilson to order a punitive expedition. That's right. The and the U.S. Army, under the command of General John J. Blackjack Pershing, chased Villa into Mexico and defeated his forces, though Pancho Villa himself escaped. Over the summer... Mexico's conservative regime turned against the American incursion, and some American soldiers were killed or captured by regime forces. The prospect of Pershing needing reinforcements prompted Roosevelt to ask his old friend, former Deadwood Sheriff Seth Bullock, quote, Are you too old to raise a squadron of cavalry in South Dakota? When Roosevelt formally requested authority to recruit a regiment, the bemused Secretary of War responded that his offer would be considered in the event of actual war. Instead, Wilson began negotiations with the Mexican government that led to the withdrawal of American troops by February 1917. Well, T.R. itching for a fight. You got the... He's going to have maybe another political fight on his hands. you got the 1916 election approaching. Yeah. He's expressing hope that the Republican and progressive parties could unite behind a single candidate. When one Republican National Convention delegate suggested that he should be that candidate, he responded, quote, Don't you nominate me if you expect me to pussyfoot on any single issue I have raised. Yeah. The progressive party which had suffered a dismal showing in the 1914 midterm election, scheduled their convention at the same time as the Republican convention on the hope of a joint Roosevelt nomination. However, conservative Republicans still held a grudge against him, and his warlike rhetoric was not playing to an electorate 
that still favored neutrality, he would run in seventh place on the first ballot at the Republican convention, which would go on to nominate former New York governor and current Supreme Court Justice Charles Evans Hughes. That's it. And the progressive convention nominates Roosevelt, who refused to accept the nomination and went on to endorse Hughes. The Progressive Party failed to choose an alternate candidate, and left in the cold by Roosevelt, they were gone by 1920. Yeah, this Roosevelt, I think is kind of like the shitty, it really seems like the shitty aspect of when he bolted the party, because yeah. he committed himself to this other party, and then left them to die. Yeah. Without him at the helm, they were not a serious party anymore. Mm-mm. And if they weren't going to become a real party, then what was all that for anyway? Well, that's it. It seems like uh, a squandered loss, as well Mm -hmm. as the breakdown of a pretty solid friendship. Yeah, and now in 1916, he seems to see the wisdom of Republicans, be they conservative or progressive, uniting behind a single candidate to beat Wilson. Yeah. But in in 1912... He let that happen. That's just it. Roosevelt actually goes on to campaign hard on Hughes's behalf. And on election night, it appeared that Hughes would win. But when all the votes were counted, the Republican stronghold of California had gone narrowly for Wilson. And that is going to tip the balance in favor of his reelection. Some Hughes supporters blamed Roosevelt's warmongering as the reason why some Republicans voted for Wilson, who ran on the slogan, he kept us out of war. Well, that slogan was in the past tense. That's it, and it's not gonna last. Because early 1917, Wilson learns of the Zimmerman telegram, a secret message in which Germany offered to help Mexico recover Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico if it joined Germany in a war against the United States. Pretty serious stuff. Yeah, that's some serious shit. We'll probably get more into this in the Wilson episode. Yeah, for sure. Germany also resumed unrestricted submarine warfare and began sinking American merchant ships in April 1917, Congress answered Wilson's call for a declaration of war. Here's what Roosevelt has been waiting for. Yeah. And he is hoping to be named a major general. He immediately asked permission to raise a division of troops for service on the European front. The war secretary coldly informs him that generals for volunteer forces will be drawn from the regular army. Roosevelt Not taking no for an answer, he asked political allies to lobby the administration on his behalf, telling them, quote, I shall not come back. My boys may not come back. My grandchildren may be left alone, but they will carry forward the family name. I must go. Yeah, he's he's ready for war. Mm -hmm. He's ready to go. He goes to the White House and he personally lobbies with President Wilson, who proves noncommittal. British and French leaders who knew Roosevelt hoped that he would be sent over, with French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau writing to Wilson that, quote, the name of Roosevelt has this legendary force in our country at this time, and that sending him would, quote, gladden the hearts of the French people. Despite all these pleas, Wilson decides to take his time to send over a professional army rather than rush in a hastily untrained volunteer force, and he informs Roosevelt that his services would not be needed. Roosevelt is left pretty distraught over this, telling Elihu Root, quote, I told Wilson that I would die on the field of battle, that I would never return if only he would let me go. Meanwhile, his four kids, they're going over. Yep, they volunteered. Ted Jr. fought on the front lines in several major battles. He was temporarily blinded by gas and earned promotions all the way up to lieutenant colonel. 
Archie was uh, promoted to captain through decorated service of his own up until his arm was crippled by shrapnel. Kermit fought with the British Army in Mesopotamia, and the youngest son, Quentin, served as a fighter pilot in France, where on July 14th, 1918, he was shot down by German pilots taking two bullets in the head before his plane crashed. Ouch. The Germans buried Quentin where he fell with military honors, and when the Allies retook that ground, his gravesite became a shrine. His parents declined the army's offer to repatriate his body, intending to visit the site after the war ended. Yeah. Pretty sad. Yeah, another pretty tragic event in the life of Teddy Roosevelt. Yep, he was quietly devastated by Quentin's death. In the 1918 midterm elections, Democrats lost both houses of Congress, and Roosevelt's uh, supporters actually believe that the field is now clear for him to win a joint Republican-Progressive nomination in 1920. But he replies to this, quote, I am indifferent on the subject. Since Quentin's death, the world seems to have shut down upon me. That's it. That's another tragic twist. After he had tried in 1912 and 1916 to run for president this time he may have actually had a chance and yeah it's too late for him that's it his health is going to begin to go on a sharp decline in november 1918 he's hospitalized when severe rheumatism renders him unable to walk learning that the war was over he said quote if i had been the kaiser when my generals told me that the war was lost i would have surrounded myself with my six healthy and unharmed sons, and would have charged up the strongest part of the Allied lines in the hope that God in his infinite goodness and mercy would give me a speedy and painless death. Wow. I mean, that's really heartbreaking, mm -hmm. especially, you know, after he had, you know, he wanted to go over there and fight so bad. I think he really wanted to die in battle. In battle. Like, that's how he wanted his life to end. And, um, you know, as it turns out, he didn't have much left to go anyway. No. Nope. In December, he suffers a pulmonary embolism and high fever. He goes home after Christmas, but continues to suffer from painful rheumatism, fever, and anemia. Edith retains a full-time nurse, and Roosevelt's former valet, James Amos, returned to help take care of him. At bedtime, Roosevelt said, James, will you please put out the light? Those were his last words. He suffered a heart attack and died sometime during the night of January 6th, 1919, at the age of 60. Still pretty young, you know. I mean, well, we've had some younger presidential deaths, but for somebody as strong as Teddy Roosevelt... Yeah. Well, he, he certainly lived 60 full years. Yeah. And he certainly I did a lot. I think he packed more in those years than most people could do in double that time. Mm -hmm. And he certainly put his body through a lot of punishment. Didn't really let up, even into older age. That's just it. Archie would go on to telegraph his siblings, quote, The old lion is dead. And upon hearing the news, Vice President Thomas Marshall said, quote, Death had to take him in his sleep, for if he was awake, there'd have been a fight. Indeed. The Oyster Bay funeral was attended by many dignitaries. Archie saw Taft sitting in the back of the church and brought him up front with the family. One of the last mourners to leave the cemetery, Taft stood by Roosevelt's grave for a long time, crying. Yeah, I think the break of their friendship is... I mean, there's a lot of really sad aspe aspects to TR's life. I think the break in their friendship was one that really fucking hurt Taft, as mm -hmm. we'll learn in the next episode. But yeah, 
pretty pretty sad. Mm -hmm. Edith is going to destroy most of her private correspondence with her husband before her death in 1948 at the age of 87 when she was buried beside T.R. in Young's Memorial Cemetery in Oyster Bay. Well, and that brings the epic life of Theodore Roosevelt to a close. That's just it. And what a life of adventure and just, just almost unbelievable. I mean, mm -hmm. like we said, movie type shit. Yeah. So he would need a at least a whole mini series to fit all the exciting episodes of his life. Yeah, that's just it. I think that he's somebody that could definitely have a mini series about him. Mhm. Mm um let's talk book and movie recommendations mm -hmm. as though you'd need them after this. Yeah. The Edmund Morris three volume Teddy Roosevelt biography. Yeah, he can't. definitely takes the cake. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. Yeah. A lot of detail. Um, I think the first volume won the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah. The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the first volume goes up to McKinley's death. The second volume is his presidency. And then final volume, Colonel Roosevelt, detailing his very storied post-presidential life yeah just for reference the second volume theodore rex that's right you could also check out david mccullough's mornings on horseback about tr which is pretty good yeah i mean there's i think a lot of great books there's one just focused on that amazon expedition by candace millard mm. i believe um there's a book by doris kearns good went on I think it's called the Bully Pulpit. I think it's on oh, yeah, that's Ro right. Roosevelt, Taft, and kind of the press relations. Yeah, yeah. Um, plus T.R.'s own books. Yeah, we mentioned a bunch of his books. He has dozens, literally, that he wrote in his yeah. life. So there's a lot to read about him mm -hmm. and from him. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of movies and the like, uh, there was the aforementioned made-for-TV series Rough Riders with Tom Berenger as Teddy Roosevelt that is pretty damn good. Mm -hmm. You know, it was pretty well done. Mm -hmm. So that's a cool uh, flick to watch if you want to look at TR and the Rough Riders and their adventures during mm -hmm. the war. Yeah. Of course, portrayed by Robin Williams in Night at the Museum. Oh, yeah, that's right. The, we missed one of those exciting intervals of his life. Yeah. Where he teams up with Ben Stiller. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's just it. Well, how to summarize Teddy Roosevelt? We can't do it. No. As is tradition, we'll leave it to his contemporaries. Firstly... Henry Adams, who said in 1904, quote, Theodore thinks of nothing, talks of nothing, and lives for nothing but his political interests. If you remark to him that God is great, he asks naively how that will affect his election. Hmm. Hmm. President who was laser focused on the business at hand. That's it. Also in 1904, we've got Elihu Root saying, quote, Men say he is not safe. He is not safe for the men who wish to prosecute selfish schemes to the public detriment, who wish government to be conducted with greater reference to campaign contributions than to the public good, who wish to draw the President of the United States into a corner and make whispered arrangements which they dare not have known by their constituents. Hmm. We also got William Howard Taft speaking in 1912 saying, quote, One who so lightly regards constitutional principles, and especially the independence of the judiciary, one who is naturally so impatient of legal restraints and of due legal procedure, and who has so misunderstood what liberty regulated by law is, 
could not be safely entrusted with successive presidential terms. I say this sorrowfully, but I say it with the full conviction of truth. And then we've got, finally, Henry Cabot Lodge, who said in 1919, upon T.R.'s death, quote, He was a great patriot, a great man, above all, a great American. His country was the ruling, mastering passion of his life, from the beginning, even unto the end. Some fitting words to close with on... Theodore Roosevelt. And I think even more fitting is we end with the sounds of the Constitutionalists with their ode to Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt. This has been Stephen Lincoln Douglas. And I'm James J. Hamilton. And for the Dead Presidents Podcast... We'll see you next time. Play us out, Constitutionalists.